Yes, thank you. <laughs> And my USB drive didn't work. Do you have one um, that I could just put my you can, thing on? Yeah, and we can take it off of it yeah. once you're done. Yeah, there you go. Um, Don't worry. We've got time. the only one because I thought, like, why can I not figure out a USB, but I always do it backwards.
need to do to advance the slides? So you try like these buttons, and I'm wondering if click on that. And that. Nope. Oh. So I don't know what's happening. Is there anyone? That is frustrating. switch here somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And that's all audio down there. But I think that that photo is coming from somewhere else. Sorry, we're seeing it on the screen. We're seeing it here, but... Okay, I'm sorry, Amy. Oh, tech problems. Yeah, these, these two things are just not communicating with each other. Yeah, it's like what we're seeing here, we're not... We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. We're so delighted to see everyone here today. My name is Amy Schultz, and I am on the faculty at the University of Michigan School of Public Health um, and co-lead with Barbara Israel in the front of the room here for the Community Engagement Core for the MLEAD um, Core Center, um, which is one of the sponsoring organizations, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. We're so delighted to have everybody 
um, here today. Um, I particularly want to um, uh, welcome the 200 odd people who are joining us by live stream webinar today. You should have all received an email this morning with instructions for the live stream and also with instructions for submitting questions when we get to the Q&A sections of the um, um, following each speaker. Send those in to us. We'll have somebody monitoring those and you'll be able to ask um, questions of the speakers. So we knew we were taking a really big risk to organize a seminar in February in Michigan. So we're really pleased that the weather was with us. We have sunshine today and that everybody was able to make it here from various parts of the state and also as particularly welcome folks who traveled um, from out state, outside the state to, um, to make it here. How many of the people in the room were able to attend the film premiere last night? Fabulous. It was a wonderful premiere. Um, thank you to Tony and all the others who were an instrumental in making that happen. I think it really set the tone for the conversation that we're hoping to have today. Um, I want to, before we begin, I want to do an acknowledgement. Um, the University of Michigan um, was founded in um, 1817 through a treaty called the, th the Treaty of um, Fort Meigs. Um, and it was when the Anishinaabe, the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, along with a number of their neighboring tribes, um, were convinced to cede portions of their land in the hope that their children would be educated in the university that was to be built on that land. The relinquishment of this land, of land during this particular historical moment came at great cost to the indigenous communities who turned it over. Um, and the hope of educational opportunities for their children has only been very partially um, realized. As we begin today's conversation, I want to acknowledge, renew, and affirm the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary tribes of the Anishinaabe to this land and to the founding of the university. I also want to begin with a few additional acknowledgments and huge thanks to people who made today possible. Um, first of all, to our um, planning team, Jody Brustowitz, Brittany Fremion, Michelle Marcus, Meredith McGeehy, Melanie Pearson, Christina Rice, Jean Steppe, and, um, and Robin Wiley. Thank you guys so much for all of your contributions to making the day happen. I also want to give a shout out to our poster reviewers, um, Sung Kyung Park, Rick Widiski, um, and Barbara Israel for, um, for, for looking at the posters and um, evaluating them. I also want to give a thanks to the Pine River um, Superfund Citizen Task Force that were really the impetus behind this conversation. Um, this group has been working on the PBB cleanup, the cleanup, cleanup of the PBB contamination in St. Louis, Michigan for 40 years. 45 years, um, and as they began to see the events unfold around the PFAS contamination, kept saying, we really need to talk. Um, we've seen this before, and we mean to need to have a conversation about this. So thank you for being the inspiration behind today's conference. The third thank you I want to give is to the members of the M Lead Center Stakeholder Advisory Board, a number of whom are in, in the room today and who have been instrumental in planning this day, and several of, of whom you're going to meet throughout the day um, in various roles. And finally, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event. The M Lead Core Center at the University of Michigan, the Hercules Exposome Center at Emory University, Central Michigan University, the University of Michigan School of Public Health, the Graham Sustainability Institute, Institute, the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research, and we the people of Detroit who all um, contributed to making the day happen. Let's give them a hand. Okay. So our overarching objective for the day today is to bring together scientists and community members, some of whom are also scientists, um, for dialogue to inform action. 
Um, it's a, a point that Drs. Marsit and, and Dole and I are going to discuss in greater depth in uh, just a moment. But I do want to just give a heads up. Toward that end, we're going to have a series of talks this morning um, of various perspectives on the issues that we're engaged with today. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to be moving into small breakout groups to do forward planning around what needs to happen next, around a specific set of issues. We have identified a priori five issues for the breakout groups, the role of health departments and state registries, policy change, preparing the next generation of researchers and activists, community research collaborations, and building national networks and movements. We also are anticipating that other topics may bubble up as we have conversations over the course of the day. If you have a burning issue that you would like to convene a group to talk about later this afternoon, we have newsprint um, sheets out by the registration desk. Please post your issue on those, um, on those newsprints at any point during the day. Um, and then when we get ready to do the breakouts in the afternoon, we will add those to the list and there'll be opportunities to folks, uh, for folks to go and, and have a conversation, okay? Um, I think that's all I have to say, Meredith. Did I forget anything business-wise? All right. Um, then I am going to yield um, the floor to Carmen Marset and Dana Dolanoy, who are going to introduce our keynote speaker. <coughs> Amy, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody uh, for attending today. Um, as Amy mentioned, this meeting grew out of a partnership that was established between the communities affected by the PBB exposures in Michigan and Emory Investigators, led by Michelle Marcus and Melanie Pearson, who maintain the PBB registry and who have established an absolutely exemplary program of community-engaged research. Um, these investigators are absolutely committed to addressing and detailing the health concerns of the individuals who have been exposed to PBB, and I couldn't be more proud to direct a center that has these people as part of it. Um, building from this work in 2018, as part of an administrative supplement to the NIHS uh, Core Research Centers Program, Emory's Hercule Exposome Research Center, along with uh, the Michigan M. Leeds Center and Central Michigan University, uh, developed a community-engaged research project that was to gather and analyze the oral histories and documents from the individuals that were exposed to PBB. This was aimed at identifying environmental health literacy themes and direct programming efforts that could be used to, to communicate effectively with stakeholders. And they have done a great job at moving this work forward. Um, this has led to a number of community meetings uh, with various types of groups, including the Michigan State Legislature and has really brought us together today. I mean, it's really from this, this work that we've developed this symposium today. Um, and we're really now being able to make these connections between these forever chemicals, PBB, PCBs, PFOS, that, were, that are really affecting lives of people throughout the country. So I thank these investigators and their community partners for helping to bring us together and doing an incredible job of moving this work forward and keeping the community's concerns really at the forefront of the science that they're doing. So I'll now turn the podium over to my friend and colleague, Dana Dolanoy, who's the director of the Michigan M. Lead Center. Dana. Thanks, Carmen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to sunny Ann Arbor, especially to our friends from the south, and also we have um, other people visiting from out of state, so welcome. Um, I'd also like to thank Amy Schultz and her team for organizing this, as well as our Emory um, partners and the Stakeholder Advisory Board. But now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda Birnbaum, retired director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, of the National Institute of Health, and the National Toxicology Program from 2009 to October of 2019 to deliver our keynote address. Dr. Birnbaum is a board certified toxicologist serving as a federal scientist for over 40 years. Prior to her appointment at NIEHS, Dr. Birnbaum spent 19 years at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where she directed the largest division focusing on environmental health research. A native to Passaic, New Jersey, which you may not know is where my parents grew up, <laughs> Dr. Birnbaum received her MS and PhD in microbiology from the University of Illinois, and she has authored more than 700 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and reports. 
Dr. Birnbaum's research focuses on pharmacokinetic behavior of environmental chemicals, mechanisms of action of toxicants, including endocrine disruption, and the linking of real-world exposures to health effects. Dr. Birnbaum has received many awards and recognitions, including in October of 2010, she was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, which is one of the highest honors in the field of medicine and health. Other awards include two NIH Directors Award, the Women in Toxicology Award, Award, the Society of Toxicology Public Communication Award, and the EPA Health Scientist Achievement Award and Diversity Leadership Award. To quote Dr. Birnbaum's long-term friend and collaborator, Michelle Marcus, one of the greatest strengths of Dr. Birnbaum that, brings the field, that she brings to the field is her ability to understand the science from the molecular to the population. Although trained as a toxicologist, she has embraced all of the data relevant to protecting human health, and during her tenure at NIEHS, she has prom promoted community engagement at every level. The NIEHS P30 mechanisms, which the MLEAD and Hercules Center are a part of, funds core research centers and requires community scientist partnerships. Thus, funds can be devoted to working with communities, to holding interactive community meetings, such as this one, and compensating community members for their input on research priorities. In many ways, through her support of the community engagement of the P30 cores, Dr. Birnbaum is the one that enabled us all to be here today to convene this important conference. And with that, Dr. Birnbaum, I'd like to welcome you to give your keynote address. Okay, let's see how I get it up here. Okay. Got to find it on here. It should be on the desk. My channel. This one? Try that. Aha, perfect. Okay. Now all I have to do is go to slideshow, which is right down is that there. One? Yep. Very good. Yep. Okay. So first of all, it's always a pleasure for me to come back to Michigan. I did spend, I don't know, eight to ten years chairing the Science Advisory Board for the School of Public Health study on dioxin exposure, focusing in the Midland area. Um, so I had the pleasure of being here quite a bit. And I've been here a couple of other times to give talks or meet with people, but always happy to come. I will say it's gorgeous here. It's snowing in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we shall see. Anyhow, what I'd like to do today really is do a whirlwind tour of from PVB to PFAS. And what I want to just show you to begin with is long ago, I would say, and far away, but one of my first things I did when I went to NIEHS in 1979 as a young tenure track scientist was I studied hexabromonaphthalene. Hexabromonaphthalenes are contaminants of the PBBs. And in fact, they are the dioxin like components of the PBB mixture. And I know that many of the effects that have been reported, both the acute and some of the long-term effects that are being seen, are really related to the AH receptor, which is the mechanism. And so this was, this was one of the first studies um, that I did really related to PBBs. But my focus was really on dioxins. So in the 1980s, among the other studies I did, I actually published three papers on perfluorodecanoic acid. That's the C10, the relative of PFOA. And the question I was asking, we knew that these chemicals caused an increase in liver weight and they affected thyroid hormones. And I said, oh, these must be dioxins. Well, I showed they weren't. And since I was focusing on dioxin, I walked away from this area. Um, you know, sometimes you make choices that come back to bite you. Um, anyhow, I'm back in the field right now and, and very, very excited. You know. I could say I'm sorry I'm back in the field because why in the heck are we all being exposed, every one of us in this room, to this class of chemicals? So this is just a couple, I'm going to go through these quickly. These are a couple like newspaper headlines that I pulled out. These I actually pulled out, I think, this summer, but there's picture of foam. Those of you who were at the movies last night, which at least I made after my flight was two hours late from Washington. But anyhow, what you can see is the tremendous amount of foam that was, that's, we find in, this is downstream from 3M. 
Okay, I'm going to remind you that 3M stopped making PFOS in 2002. It was a voluntary agreement, and DuPont's, well, 3M was actually the source of PFOA that led to the contamination, like in the Ohio River Valley, but DuPont stopped making it in about 2012 or something. They kind of turned it over to Keymore's, which is in my neighborhood, and I can tell you at some point about the contamination we have in North Carolina. Um, anyhow, there's the Van Eaton Lake. Van Eaton are going into entering the lake. Uh, that's from a picture from um, from sometime last year. And then there was just something about you know um, the Clovis City water in New Mexico. We saw uh, a farmer from New Mexico on the film last night, and we know. If you live near a major Air Force base, in fact, I would argue if you live near any mil military base, any main fi firefighting station, any emergency thing, you're going to find that there's PFAS um, all around you. Um, and, and then the other one that we have over here is, is the, uh, that was from Clovis City, oh, that's from Clovis City, New Mexico, I'm sorry, I'm going ahead. And then this was just in one of your papers recently about all the PFAS in the Saginaw River. Now, I'm pretty familiar with the Saginaw from the dioxins and the PCBs that contaminate it. I guess, why would we think it wouldn't have these other persistent organic chemicals in the water? And then I was very interested to read just about a month ago about how the state of Michigan is now suing 17 chemical companies for PFAS um, contamination. Maybe a little late, but better than never. Um, so we've got that. So really, what are the per and, porf and polyfluoroalkyl substance? I have to tell you, the, the acronym PFAS is horrible. It's a horrible choice because I always now, I say PFAS to get the A in there, because there's also PFOS, which is, <laughs> which is a specific chemical. But the point is, this is a huge class. There are over 5,000 of these chemicals that have been intentionally synthesized. That doesn't mean there aren't more that turn out to be breakdown products of much longer chain or branch chain molecules that are being broken down in the atmosphere. Sometimes, what do they give us? PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS you kind of name it, um, going on down. Um, and frankly, we don't know the totality of what's being made out there. Why do we have them? We have them because they have very, very useful properties. They're resistant to grease and water and oil. They're surfactants. They're stain repellents. I have to tell you, I bought a pair of really nice shoes, hiking shoes recently, and on the box is a big sign that says, totally water resistant. And I said, I don't want them. <laughs> because <laughs> I know what that means. Um, anyway, but and then we also know that they've been extensively used for fire suppression in the AFFF. What you might hear from some of the defense folks is that um, only three to six percent of AFFF is PFAS. Like that's okay when you use tons and tons and tons of this stuff um, that adds up. What are the problems with them? They are persistent and many of them are bioaccumulative. They are so persistent in the environment, and you all know they're called the forever chemicals. I think I'm the one who actually coined that about a year ago, but the point is they are never going to leave the environment. They barely occur in nature. There is no natural way to break them down. They are very difficult to break that carbon fluorine bond. In fact, we're being uniquely unsuccessful at doing that. So once they're made, we're going to have them in the environment, whether they persist in our bodies or not. And things that only are in our bodies for short periods of time, that doesn't mean that they're safe. And again, th we have all the short change alternatives. So what I have up here on the bottom, you have PFOS and PFOA, and then you have some of what are called the short chains. Again, terrible nomenclature. What it means is that you don't have as long a run of carbons with fluorines. You break it up with something. You may only have four carbons or five carbons, or you may have three carbons and an oxygen and then another three carbons and then an oxygen and another three carbons. Those are called short chains. And the idea is, is that these won't last in our bodies, but they will last in the environment. So how are we exposed? I've already given you some of the hint about that. These are a very diverse group of chemicals. And they haven't been around for 40 years, guys. They've been around for 60 years. In fact, they were really first made in the 1940s um, in a lab 
um, where they're first synthesized. But they're in your carpet and fabric. I should tell you that Home Depot and Lowe's no longer are having these put on any carpets you get there. It's good news. Um, they're on lots of different kinds of paper that's used on food. So, you know, the thing your hamburger's wrapped in when you get it from your fast food stop. Um, pots and pans, um, just a warning. Um, when you go to wherever you go and you see these new nonstick pans and there are big signs on them that say, no PFOA, what should that tell you immediately? Else. It's got a short chain one in there, <laughs> immediately. Unless it says no PFAS, be beware. Um, it's on lots of our clothing. Um, it's, again, cardboard packaging and firefighting foams, of course. And one thing I want to mention is so much of the focus lately has been on what's in our water, our drinking water and our ground water. Remember, it's also in our food. And guess what? It's in our air, too. And there has been no work done, really, on the inhalation. And I can tell you, if things are inhaled, they're going to go to different places in our bodies, and different things may happen to them. So this is just a, sch a quick schematic from Elsie Sutherland of Harvard, where she was putting together the different, let's see, oh, wait, goody, I do have a, have a pointer. Whoops. A little too aggressive there. Oh, forget it. I'm going to go back to the slideshow. Let's see if we can get it to the right place. If one of my grandkids were here, they would do it immediately. <laughs> Whoops. Ah, OK, back to PFAS exposure. Um, what you can see here is the industry is making it. It goes into AFFF. It goes into loads of consumer products. And from the different sources, it gets into the waste infrastructure and the stream. And we get exposed. And I would remind you that who among us have some of the highest levels. It's our newborn babies and our infants because this does cross, these compounds cross the placenta and they are transferred through breast milk as well. Breast is still best, people, please. You know, you know, still best to nurse your baby, but why should that have to be something you even think about is the safety of your breast milk. Okay, so I think important thing when we talk about water as a source of exposure, this is a, a study that was really, I think, kind of got the issue up and running again in 2016, where l using EPA's own data from their um, Chemicals of Emerging Concern Network, what they found was that there were at least six million people uh, across the country who were exposed to elevated levels of PFAS. Now, that's a funny definition because what do they mean by elevated? You have to go back and actually look and find that their levels of detection were very high at that point in time. So, in fact, the Environmental Working Group a year or two later said, no, it's about 110 million people are exposed to elevated levels in their drinking water when, in fact, you looked more carefully. But the really important point here is that if you live or if your water is near a production source or a use source, it's going to be more elevated. So you have, for example, the stuff there about the industrial sites and, for example, um, if the AFFF was used, for example, or if you're near a water treatment plant. I should tell you that biosolids coming out of water treatment plants should probably be considered hazardous waste um, in most cases. At least I can tell you it is true in North Carolina. Okay. So what about contamination due to AFFF? Um, this is a study that was done as a community-based study. Um, when I was at NIEHS, and I, they're continuing it, we ran a program called Time Sensitive Awards, because sometimes you have a contamination in, in, um, incident, and if it takes you a year to get funding to study it, it's already gone. So you've got to be able to get in there more quickly. And these are awards that can be done within about 90 to 120 days. And this was a study d done near Colorado Springs. You all know there's a large Air Force. That's where the Air Force Academy is. And there's a large Air Force base there. And communities in the area are highly contaminated. And so went and did a study, um, John Adgate from University of Colorado, Colorado University uh, School, of uh, School of Public Health, went in and he looked at, these are just, he measured additional PFAS compared to, in addition to these. But what you can see is, what's the contamination? PFHXS and PFOS are the major contaminants. And those are signatures for AFFF. And so that, that was important studies. Um, 
Okay, so I've talked about water. I wanted to mention the fast food packaging issue. And again, um, this was a study that where they actually measured total fluorine using a method called PIGI, um, where they actually look at what's in, in, in the molecule, total organic fluorine. That's important. You know, we all know that in many places we have fluoride in our drinking water, um, inorganic fluoride for our teeth. But this is organic fluoride, and this is looking at um, solid surfaces. But what you can see, your dessert and your um, food wrappers are um, highly contaminated and are the most contaminated. And then your sandwich and burger wrappers and then paperboard. Paper cut seem, seemed okay. This was a study of about 400 samples. And the group went in and they actually did high resolution mass spectroscopy on a small sample of the things and were able to actually identify that the most common PFAS in their sam samples were PFOA and then two short chains, PFHXS and PFBS. And the 6-2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. Okay, I'll tell you that these 6-2, the fluorotelomer sulfonates and the fluorotelomer alcohols break down to give you the, like the PFOA and the PFOS kinds of chemicals as well. Um, now this was an interesting study um, that came out just, just, I think it was just last summer, where um, this was comparing the levels of, um, in, in serum, of some of the, quote, long chain ones, PFDA, PFNA, PFOA. So DA is 10, and that's 9, and that's 8 carbons, and PFOS. And what you see is that in most cases, there are elevated levels in the people who ate a lot of fast food. And the dark circles are African Americans in this population versus um, non-Hispanic white Americans, and what you can see again. And this appears to be associated actually with the amount of fast food consumption. Um, and possibly the amount of fast food, it turns out French fries were a major contributor um, in this study. But the point is we all have PFAS in our bodies. I, I kind of started out saying that. Um, and, and this is not just in the United States or in developed countries, it's all over the world. I'm gonna show you a slide later from Alaska where our Native American peoples there have e elevated levels of PFAS. These things, like all the pop, although PFAS are very different than the dioxins and the PCBs or the DDT because they don't stay in your fat. They tend to bind to proteins so that they're, for example, we know they're in, in our blood I'm going to show you some data that makes us wonder, do we really know where else they are in our body? But the point is, is that, you know, these things travel. They're highly mobile. So that, you know, our uh, people, as well as our animals who are at the top of the food chain, are more contaminated. And these things undergo global distillation. So they volatilize in temperate climates, and then they come down where it gets closed. So the Arctic is quite highly contaminated, for example. And this is all over the world. And while PFOA and PFOS are not made intentionally in the US anymore, they're made in China. OK. We could talk some time about maybe why the outbreak of coronavirus, you know, could people be immunosuppressed? It's a whole other issue. But anyway, um, but this is just looking at the levels. The good news is since in the US they stopped producing PFOA and PFOS intentionally, if you look up here, what you can see is the levels of those have come down, but they've actually started to plateau, which is just like we saw with the PCBs, you know, because they're recirculating in the environment. Um, and that there's really no change for some of the ones that haven't been regulated at all or drawn much attention. So this is the table I was telling you about. This is actually the only study I know which looked at autopsy specimens. And this was done in Catalonia um, in northern Spain. And I think the point that I want to that I want to make here is look at how much of the short chain PFBA and PFHXA there are in the lung. Okay? And for example, PFA, I can understand why there it's in the kidney, because the kidney, it may be getting eliminated through the kidney, but look at the lung, and then look at the brain levels for some of them. We need another study, somebody else, I keep pushing, somebody. You know, if you do a study of um, autopsy specimens, it's not considered human research, so you can get it done sooner. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't require the same level of um, uh, scrutiny. But I think that it's interesting. You can see again the PFO um, in the liver, the PFOS is elevated. But look at all the PFOA in the bone. And in fact, a recent study came from Finland 
demonstrating impacts of um, th these kind of chemicals, the PFAS on the bone. This was another, just was comparing some of the levels in, in different areas of the world. So for example, where you have contamination and not. So the top is, gives you an idea of the C8 study, which is that's the study in, in the Ohio Valley. And I hope many of you have seen Dark Waters. Um, if not, I kind of recommend it. It's, it's the study of how that contamination was revealed and how some satisfaction was achieved for, for the residents and the people of that area. But what you can see here is that the, um, the, the uh, PFOA was elevated. People forget PFOS was elevated too in that population. And so compared to NHANES in 2013 and, and 2015, but then huge contamination in the Venice area of Italy. I mean, it's a major contamination site and they're doing some really nice work following up the population there. So you can see in Veneto, this was some data that, that they sent me um, from their doing an updated health surveillance as well as a biomonitoring of the population in that area. And what you can see is how high the level of PFOA was in that population. Um, and they are seeing impacts on cholesterol levels and other lipid levels and they're following, um, they're following children as well as the adults in that population. So interesting one to follow. Um, this is just showing that uh, this is some very interesting data. Gloria Post is probably the world's guru on PFOA. Uh, she's with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And um, sh this is just looking at the, uh, the blood levels. You can predict them as drinking water levels rise. So I think it may have been in the film last night or maybe it was in the discussion can't remember, but the point was is that if your water isn't heavily contaminated, you're getting your PFAS from your food and the dust in your house that's coming off your carpets, et cetera. But if your water's contaminated, that's going to be your major source. And you can roughly use a factor roughly of 100 to go from the level of water multiplied by 100, and that'll give you an idea of what the level might be in your serum, in your blood. So it's just a rough um, calculation that you can use. Okay, nobody's got to memorize the laundry list, and I think in this group you may have a good idea of, of how broad and wide this is. So I'm busy calling PFAS the dioxins or the PCBs of the 21st century because, again, you have a large group of chemicals, actually larger than the PCBs or the dioxin, that cause a plethora of effects in multiple tissues, both males and females, um, multiple life, many life stages, and across the vertebrate kingdom. Why would anyone think that some people would not be responsive? I mean, I just put it that way. So anyway, this is kind of a list. You know, many of these things have been really seen very clearly in the large C8 study, but they've also been reported in a growing list of other epidemiological investigations. Uh, the cancer, testicular kidney, there's also indications that there may be other cancers as well. Remember, cancer is not, you gotta have a big population and you gotta to get the good data. Ulcerative colitis, which I, is an autoimmune disease, so it affects on the immune system. High cholesterol, pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, thyroid disruption, hormone changes, liver, obesity, immunotoxicity. Um, I'm going to show you just like brief data on some of these. Lower birth weight and size, delayed puberty, decreased fertility, early menopause, reduced testosterone, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, changes in bone density. And I can add on to this. This is not a complete list. Um, but this is, I would say, most of these are pretty well documented in multiple studies. So this is, um, the NTP did, did a systematic review of the immune effects of PFOA and PFOS that was published, peer-reviewed and published in 2016. And what they found was that there was really clear evidence in multiple animal species. You know, I'm not just talking rats. I'm not just talking mice. I'm also talking monkeys. And there is also evidence from humans. And some of the human data is shown um, on your right, which is, is the suppression of the antibody response to uh, diphtheria. And this is associated with both in utero and childhood exposure. So we've seen this before. The, the, these are actually studies coming out of birth cohorts in the Faroe Islands. Uh, Philippe Grandjean and his colleagues have been following since the 1980s essentially almost every child born in the Faroe Islands um, over this time. But they've looked at the kids at 
that after they get an antibody booster, they look several months later, and they've looked at age five and age seven, and now even age 13. And these kids, they cannot mount a normal antibody response. What does that mean? Should we ask the question, are some of the measles cases, not because people weren't vaccinated, but in fact, they didn't have a therapeutic response? I mean, I think those are questions that we should begin to be asking. And I can tell you, this, uh, um, these results have basically been replicated in uh, northern Japan and the Hokkaido birth cohort. And they've also, some, some of these kinds of things have been seen in several others as well. Um, Ongoing PFOA exposures are associated with abnormal gestational weight gain. You can see in the dotted line there that the women with the higher levels are gaining weight faster during pregnancy. And there appears to be an association with an increase in gestational diabetes related, especially, for example, to uh, PFOS and PFHXS, but there does seem to be an association there. Um, and th the concern here is that gestational diabetes increases the risk for type 2 diabetes later, later on. So um, I think this is, this is, again, another study looking at the relationship between PFOS concentrations and the risk of type 2 diabetes. One thing I want to point out here is it looks like the greatest risk is maybe associated with the lowest exposure. And then basically, if you're sensitive, and that's a point to remember, you know, not everybody's equally susceptible. You know, there's a genetic basis, there's what else is going on in your life, there are other stressors and so on. But I think it's important to realize that, you know, you may see the greatest effect at the lowest exposure levels. But again, there are multiple net studies now showing associations between PFAS and type 2 diabetes. And then this is an interesting study showing that, and I think this is kind of viva la difference, boys and girls are not the same. Um, you know, I can tell you years ago when I was doing lots of stuff in the labs, if I didn't get the same result with my male and female rats, I thought there was something wrong with my experiment. Now I know there was something right with my experiment because, in fact, they can respond differently. But the important point here is that both birth weight and head circumference, there is an increase, um, in, in, a decrease in birth weight and an increase in head circumference, and it's greater in the boys than in the girls here. So there's also effects on uh, a developmental neurotoxic effect that's been observed. So this is just, you know, I've, I've pulled out just snippets of data to show you. But some of the data here showing the increased PFNA, that's the C9 relative of PFOA. And the point here is these are all different measures of executive function in the brain. And without looking at my notes, I can't tell you, I don't remember exactly which each one means, but they are all, and what you can see is that this is especially true by eight years of age. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember. Things can happen due to early life exposure that you don't see immediately, that it can take three years, eight years, 20 years, 40 years before you actually see the impacts, but clearly an impact on brain function um, in children following early life ex exposure. And then there are lots of studies associating PFAS with altered kidney and thyroid function. That came out of the C8 study, came out of loads of animal studies. And this is a study done in a community in Ohio upstream of where the contamination occurred. But there was contamination from other sources, um, from not only PFOA and PFOS, but PFNA, PFHXS, and PFDA. And what they saw was um, decreased kidney function measured by glomerular filtration rate and an increase in TSH. And I want to point out that in humans, when the thyroid gets screwed up, what you tend to see is changes in thyroid stimulating hormone. In our rats and mice, what you tend to see is a change in circulating thyroxin levels. The change in TSH says that thyroid is being stressed. It's having trouble getting out, say, enough T4 in order to function normally. So we have to remember that. And the other point here is we, last night we heard some discussion about the half-life of these chemicals. So PFOA has a half-life of roughly two to three years. PFOS has a half-life roughly four to six years. And I say rough because there's variability um, in people. PFHXS appears to have a half-life of greater than 10 years, not only from this study, but there's a highly exposed population in Sweden that's being followed, and again, very, very long half-life for PFHXS. 
So the key question I'd say is, okay, so PFOA, PFOS, they're not being made, they're still with us, some of them will be with us forever, but so we now have replacements and we should be asking the questions. Are they persistent? Well, I've already told you in the environment they're certainly gonna be persistent. Are they toxic? Well, we better look at that. And toxicity, there's maybe a difference between acute and long time toxicity. Um, are they well taken up? Where do they go? Can we get rid of them? And I'll come back briefly maybe to the issue of can we get rid of them. I'll tell you right now. Well, let me tell you because I don't really think I have slides about that. But while um, granular activated charcoal filters, if you keep changing them, can remove it from your drinking water, the PFOA and the PFOS and the long chain ones, it doesn't, does next to nothing with these new short chain ones. The only thing that we know at this point really that can well remove the short chains are um, reverse osmosis. Um, and if you reverse osmosis, to put it like you could put it in your, under your sink in your kitchen um, is not horribly expensive, but to do it for your whole house, you're talking thousands of dollars. Um, so this is a major issue that we have to, have to begin to think about. Um, okay, so what about, these are just some effects of alternatives to PFOA and PFOS on the li uh, liver. This is looking at some of the fluorotelomer carboxylic acids and the sulfonated acids. And what you can see is that especially the PFOS alternative has lots of effect on cytokines in the livers, which uh, those are related to our immune system, and again um, on uh, ones in the livers, the serum and the liver, you can see. So there are clearly effects there. And then... Um, I, I've already mentioned to you that the telomer alcohols break down to give you the PFAS that aren't alcohols. And so these, these are present, many of them, as side chains on long polymers. And what happens? They don't get broken down, but they get cleaved off the polymer. And so that now you get the fluorotelomer alcohol, say, in the atmosphere, and then it can break down to give you uh, the, the carboxylic acid or the sulfonate. And I think we should also remember that, yes, polymers are not going to be well biologically absorbed. I'll agree to that. But to make the polymers, you've got to use monomers, things like PFOA or PFOS or PFBA, the four chain, or you've got to use my favorite Gen X, something like that. But the point is, is those things escape during production. And again, some of them can be produced during breakdown. And then what do we do with polymers that will never go away? I think most of us agree that we don't want a lot of styrofoam anymore because it'll be here a million years from now. So why are may we making other polymers that will be here um, certainly for as long as humanity may survive? Uh, this is just a study looking, whoops, how come that didn't come up? Oh, there it is. Uh, the class comparison of PFAS in the liver. Uh, my NTP did 28-day um, studies in rats of seven different PFAS, both short-chain and long-chain ones. And basically, um, just to give you the take-home lesson, this is looking at some of the enzymatic responses, the biochemical responses. So the short-chain ones did just what the long-chain ones done. You just had to use more of them. And that's because their half-life in the body is shorter, so you have to give them a higher dose. But if you give them enough, you get the same liver effects, you get the same thyroid effects. Those are the endpoints that were looked like um, in that. And currently, NTP is looking at the immune response for these. I can tell you that PFDA does the same thing as PFOA in suppressing the immune response, at least in uh, the mice where they're, where they're being looked at. So um, NTP has also said, wait a minute, there are 5,000 of these chemicals, plus or minus. There is no way that we can test every chemical, you know, that's going to be made. We've got to approach something different. So they're looking at a class kind of approach that on your right is just um, from a paper from Wang et al., um, where they, um, they were kind of trying to group the PFAS into different classes. So NTP is working with EPA right now. They're actually testing more than 160 different chemicals, seeing whether they can group them based on a variety of short-term, uh, both uh, computational and in vitro assays related to response to get some idea whether they can do that. They're also looking at 10 different um, mil-spec AFFFs um, as well. 
and the idea is this could focus research. Well, I had, couldn't leave North Carolina out of the equation since that's where I'm from, but um, up in your right-hand corner is kind of a little bit of map of the Cape Fear River. You can see where the Chemours plant is, kind of right by, um, let's see, uh, B is up, A is upstream, B is where the plant is, and then C is where the city of Wilmington, a city of 260,000 people, that their entire drinking water supply was heavily contaminated by Gen X because Keymore was just dumping it, into the, dumping it into the river. They had said that they weren't doing it, but it turns out that they were. Um, in addition, I should tell you, the river has lots of other PFAS in it. In fact, when Mark Streiner and, and Dieter Netliff and Lee Ferguson and some of the other chemi uh, chemists went in and took samples from the river, they could only account for 20% of the PFAS in the river. That's all that they could accurately define uh, that they had standards for. So there was lots of stuff that they don't even know what it was in the river. And I should tell you, if you happen to live near where the Chemours plant was, all, you know, there were, turns out there were air emissions because they, it was just going out the stack. And so if you had your nice garden or farms in that area, their produce was all contaminated um, as well. But anyhow, um, the group from North Carolina State, working with the group, actually people from the state and working with people from Eastern Carolina University, got together, and some folks from Duke even, that was quite amazing. Um, they got them, <laughs> well, there's a lot of rivalry in North Carolina. <laughs> Um, but anyhow, they got together and they did a community study where they recruited several hundred people from the ages of six to whatever, um, non-pregnant women, um, and they measured, but this was, this was, by the time they got in there, it was six months after the state had said to Kimors, you got to stop this. And so the levels in the river had dropped, okay? So anyway, but they measured Gen X in drinking water, blood, and urine, and basically they didn't find, they found it in, some in the water, levels were low, but they couldn't find any Gen X in the people. But guess what? They found other things in the people. They found not only PFOS and some PFOA, they also found four brand new um, PFAS that had never been reported in people before. Some of these are what we call short chains. You know, they're ones with um, ether linkages, oxygen linkages between the carbons. And again, some of these dropped once chemo stopped dumping it into the river. And, but again, what you can see is that the, the levels of the legacy PFAS, the PFOA and the PFOS, were four times higher than they were in the general NHANES, which is the sampling of the US population at the same point in time. So this is an, these are some couple of my studies I'm, that I'm gonna show you because I think it's important to realize I already told you that I think, you know, if you see something in lots of animals, it's likely to happen in some people. And I think when we have epidemiological findings, the uh, believability of those is strengthened, not only by repetition of that kind of study, but when you have animal data where you get the same kind of responses. You know, we all know that rats are not people. Some people might be rats, but that's another <laughs> issue too. <laughs> Anyhow, so, it's wonderful to be retired, guys. <laughs> Anyhow, so what you can see, this was a comparison. Sue Fenton, who is um, at NIH SNTP, has been doing a series of studies, um, developmental studies, um, using mice in her model. And this is where she's exposing them, starting right from um, the initiation of pregnancy throughout pregnancy and looking, for example, at the level um, in the liver um, and, and looking also at responses. But what you can see here is basically the liver levels, for example, this is comparing a dose of PFOA to Gen X. Now remember, Gen X is rapidly eliminated, but you can still see some in there, okay? But the important thing is when you look at it's, you're still seeing an increase in gestational weight gain, weight gain with the Gen X. And again, you can see um, here whether you're looking kind of at the statistical approach or even just looking at the data. And in fact, you're seeing the same thing with Gen X that you see with PFOA, even though the levels in the le liver are so much lower. So you could say it's hit and run, although these animals are being dosed every day, but it 
getting in there, it's having an effect, and it's causing a response. And then there's these effects on mammary gland development. Sue is probably one of the world's expert on um, rodent mammary gland development. And this is the data with PFOA, where you can see basically a dose response in basically inhibition of the development of the mammary gland. That number should be higher. Um, as the gland develops, there's the branching of the, the mammary ductals that grow out to eventually give you the places that can produce milk. So you can see that as you increase the PFOA um, dose, that level goes, uh, you get less development, and you see exactly the same thing with Gen X. Um, so again, Gen X is doing the same thing. So another example of a short chain doing the same thing as a long chain. Um, so just to remind you, and I forgot a stick bone on here, because I had made this a few months ago. I shouldn't say I made it. This is when I worked. Someone made this for me just before I left. And you know, it's so pretty. You can probably tell the slides I made versus the, <laughs> the ones I pulled together. But anyhow, the point here is that you know, a multi-system toxicant, or family of toxicants, I should say. Well, I gave you two examples of community research, the one in Colorado and the one in um, in, in North Carolina. But I just really want to emphasize the importance of community-engaged research. I mean, people have quoted me because I say it. You can't do environmental health research unless you work with the communities. And that doesn't mean a helicopter trip. That means you get in from the get-go because the communities, they're the ones who are living it. They know the questions that need to be addressed. And the beauty of some of this is, is the communities also, not only do the scientists grow, but the communities grow um, in their knowledge as well. So again, completely advancing the research um, general. It really, as I said, builds the capacity of everybody. Um, in, in our country, environmental health, science literacy is terrible. Environmental science literacy is even worse. Working in communities, we can help them um, understand that better. We really can get um, youth involved. Frequently, they become the boots on the ground in many of our community engagement, our NIEHS community engagement cores. You know, there's a lot of work going on, especially with the teenagers um, who, who really get turned on. We increase diversity of the field, and diversity strengthens, um, strengthens all of us a, as people. And again, you get the community involved. Even when grant funding runs out, the community is still there and they're still involved. We need to think about cultural sensitivity um, when we're working with communities. Um, often, some of the investigators are not of the same racial or ethnic mix or socioeconomic mix as the communities in which they work, and you need to be sensitive um, to that. Um, and, and we need to understand that in a community, there's variations even within a community. That, that we have to be sensitive to. Um, gender and age, I made the joke before that if I had a problem with a computer, I'd go to my youngest grandkid, you know, but I think that's true in many places. People of different ages are going to respond different, um, differently. We have differences in language, and some of that, everybody might speak English in a community, but they don't mean the same thing. And we have to um, work at understanding that. And again, we have to listen as well as speak. Um, this is just some pictures from um, St. Lawrence Island, uh, which is in, in, well, it's a small island right near the International Date Line in the Bering Sea, about 180 miles southwest, south, yes, yeah, southwest of Nome. I've been there. I paid a visit because these are some of the most contaminated people in, um, in our country. Um, they're, they're contaminated in part because they're subsistence hunters and fishers, so they're eating animals at the top of the food chain, whales, seals. They used to be called the walrus hunters because walrus was their specialty, but now because of climate change, and I can say that, the, the, the wa <laughs> um, you know, uh, the walrus basically the ice, when they usually go fishing for, uh, hunting for walrus, is in the early spring, and the ice doesn't come far, solid ice is not far enough south anymore. The walrus are now landing up and beaching by Barrow at the very top of Alaska. They're not coming far enough south. 
Um, these people are also eating the fish in the couple of streams on this island. I have to tell you this, I have to say this. So there, during the Cold War, there were two um, uh, Air Force bases on the island um, that were listening stations for the Russians. And on a clear day, which I can't believe happens very often, because <laughs> at least when I was there, couldn't, we ended up sitting in Nome in the, in the airport, which is just like a square box, um, for two days before the planes could fly. But when you, you know, on a clear day, you can see Russia. <laughs> Anyway, and Sarah Palin's husband was stationed on St. Lawrence Island, and maybe that's where she thought that from Wasilla, which is a suburb of Anchorage, she could see it. Anyway, that's another issue. Um, but anyway, I will tell you, the work that, that NIH has done with a community group called ACAP, the, Ameri the uh, Alaskan Communities Against Toxics, where they have developed leadership roles, they've funded grants, they've trained their young people. They've actually, young people, and by that I mean uh, teenagers and even people in their early 20s, have gone to the international meetings on POPs in Geneva, Switzerland, to talk about their situation. And they are highly exposed, not only, for example, to PCBs, but to PFAS as well. So community engagement, this is, I'm just gonna, I didn't know how to show all the community engagement that's going on, but related explicitly to PFAS, but I just, kind of what I did was highlight some words that I thought might help you, you know, get some of the ideas of what all the different community groups, for example, are doing, and the universities, these are just ones that are working in this area, really, on the East Coast. Water testing, making presentations, preparing fact shops, holding workshops, holding community meetings, developing databases, providing technical expertise, working on remediation approaches, um, partnering with different, different groups, measuring PFAS in wells, um, developing infographics, working with state representatives, federal representatives, I should say, too, being on the radio, um, having booths at different kinds of uh, community meetings, and doing community um, uh, screening which I think is, is really important. You know, don't see as well. Anyway, um, so what are some of the conclusions from what I've been telling you that I think we should be thinking about going forward? We are all exposed to PFAS. There are too many to do proper mixture toxicological kinds of testing. Um, the PFAS are all persistent, and we think that they are all highly mobile. Um, on a life cycle basis. Therefore, we want to prevent new problems but, or existing problems by eliminating non-essential uses. If you don't need it, let's forget about it. And we have limits for existing PFAS contamination is more difficult. I already said we can't remediate a river system. We can't remediate, you know, uh, thousands of square miles of contaminated land, for example. Um, so the key research questions that I think we should be looking at, I want to know is what we're measuring in my blood, and at this point, we routinely measure maybe 16. Some groups can get measure 25. There are 5,000 of these. So are we measuring 90% of what's in our blood, or are we looking at 10% of what's in our blood? That makes a huge difference. There was one paper that's been published where people tried to look at that, and it, in one population it was 80 percent, good, and in another population it was about 30 percent, not so good. So I think there, we need to get better at these total organic analyses. We really have to deal with the issue of essentiality. Where are the chemicals really, really needed, and where can we replace with safer alternatives? You know, and we've got to ask the question before we do you know, the whack-a-mole approach. Are our substitutes any better? And I've shown you some data that says we're not clear that they are. And again, how can we address PFAS? As a class, a single class, or subclasses? So the idea of addressing chemicals as a class, I have to tell you, I mean, that's how we treat dioxins. We treat, that's how we treat PCBs. I don't understand why this is considered such a novel 
um, concept. But the National Academies, um, on a request from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, recently opined, after consensus study, that in fact, you could look at all the organohalogen flame retardants and treat them in a class approach. They suggested you might have to break them into several classes, but you didn't have to look at every single one. So should we think about that events that might have shifted our environmental health paradigm? For example, DDT and persistent pesticides, you know, Silent Spring, that kind of is what led to the creation of EPA by Richard Nixon in 1970. Uh, the Chernobyl nuclear plant and the concern with um, nuclear power. Vopal, India, with their terrible chemical contamination where there are, I mean, thousands, I think it was about 30 or 40,000 people died quickly. There are still impacts on people who survived. Or Libby, Montana, uh, the asbestos contamination there. Um, it's the only Superfund site in the nation where we actually have dead bodies, unequivocal, with lots of mesothelioma, not only in the mine workers, but in residents of the town. So I think we want to ask our PFAS, may, are they going to shift our approach to emerging chemicals? I mean, PFAS have emerged, but is it going to make us look differently as we go forward? Are the understandings that we're getting you know, coming out of the C8 study in Parkersburg or in my neighborhood in Fayetteville, the Keymores in North Carolina or all the military bases. Is it going to make us think differently? Well, it's actually four and a half years ago that the Madrid Statement on Highly Fluorinated Chemicals came out, which said, we call on the international community to cooperate in limiting production and use of PFAS and in developing safer non-fluorinated alternatives. Where did that statement it was signed by hundreds and hundreds of scientists. And so my final thought is one we should, I think, we should all ask. Why do we continue to make chemicals that will never go away? Didn't we learn our lesson more than 40 years ago that we don't want to make chemicals that are very persistent? So thank you all. Do we, have to, do we have time for questions? Do we have time for questions? Thank you, Linda. We have just a few minutes for question and discussion, and I particularly want to um, remind folks who are joining us remotely that you can send in questions. We will be monitoring on this end. Um, so about five minutes for a few questions. For that if you, I even really kept on time. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> Any questions? Happy to answer them. Yeah. So uh, Ann Arbor has a treatment plant that uses right? Right. Um, what do you do with the, the carbon? And so what they're doing is they're uh, trying to be very careful and they're cooking it under very high temperature. And they say that that actually, in their opinion, degrades and destroys the, the target chemical and that they reuse the ethylene carbon. So I don't know if you've heard that or is that, is that something? Is, they're very tight chemicals. They're hard to break up. I know that. So you have to heat it to, I've heard some people say greater than 1,200 degrees, others say greater than 1,400, I've even seen greater than 1,600. I can tell you that if you go on EPA's website about incineration and ask, you know, can you use incineration to get rid of PFAS, the answer is that hasn't been clearly shown. I think there are some people that thermal oxidation, people say can work. You may be able to do it with limited amount of material, like, say, granular activated charcoal, you know, that's coming out of a filter. You can't do it for a river. You can't do it for a lake. So, you know, you're treating um, a popular, uh, uh, or you, it's a limited utility. And I would remind you that the uh, GAC, that's granular activated charcoal, does not do a good job at removing um, any of the short chain. A paper was just published last week 
um, coming out of Heather Stapleton's lab along with a, 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 a bunch of others um, showing that in fact that the that it really uh, um, the short chains are not well removed by that so you know I think we have to ask these become environmental justice questions you know people can't afford to put reverse osmosis systems in their house um, some people really will be able to put it in under their sink um, I was feeling really good about my house because I have a new refrigerator and it has a you know a charcoal filtration system built into the refrigerator well um, my house was one of the ones that um, Heather sampled <laughs> and you know it doesn't remove a lot of what's in our waters now so I'm you know beginning to say I need to do something else so other questions yeah show that these chemical contaminations um, cause obesity. And some studies a couple of years ago came out and said, Michigan and Ohio have some of the most obese people in the country. So I can't help but make that leap from the, con the chemical contamination to obesity. But I was wondering, on what basis have you identified that it causes Okay. So there is are some, okay. There are several epidemiological investigations that show it. There are a bunch of experimental animal studies that show it, and there are mechanistic studies. So the PPA, uh, the um, PFAS, are activators of PPAR gamma, which is a specific receptor that we have in our bodies that is involved in fat production and the generation of more adipocytes. And that is probably the reason we're seeing problems with bone density, because there's almost a switch. You either go to bone or you go to adipocytes. It's kind of that switch. So there, I, I wouldn't say necessarily these chemicals are making us fat. I would say they are increasing the risk for us to be fat. Thanks for that. OK, and well, I have one gentleman here, and then we'll take the remote one. Thank you. Um, but I would like to know, as far as the cooking wear and the clothing wear, what makes the chemical fall off in, like, into our food when okay. we're cooking or when we're wearing our jackets? Okay, so these chemicals are not chemically bonded to the surface of your clothes or your carpets or your cookware. They are added. So, for example, years ago, I know people said to me, oh, if you have Teflon pans, don't use them on a really high heat because that will increase some of the volatilization um, from the surface. So it's just, they just come off. You know, they're not, it's, you don't have a chemical bond linking that PFOA or Gen X, or, Gen X, by the way, is, is a replacement for PFOA, um, you know, linking it to whatever product you're talking about. They're just basically on the surface. And that's why we find very heavy, high levels of these compounds like in dust, in house dust, for example. Uh, the question from the. It's really difficult. It's a very, very difficult problem. But I think this is the absence of regulation has made this so much worse. Um, states are out ahead of the federal government. Um, there is essentially no federal regulation. Um, EPA in 2016 issued a lifetime health advisory, which many of us think is way too high. Um, but it was a lot better than having nothing, but it's not a regulatory rule. Uh, what uh, Representative Debbie Dingell was trying to get through um, in the last Congress was, was getting PFAS listed as, um, as Superfund chemicals, as hazardous chemicals, which would have meant that they would fall under the Superfund regulation, where they which would lead to some kind of regulation. Um, but th the issue is, is, in my personal view, I think that we need to regulate these as a class. 
Um, I talked about briefly this issue of essentiality. It was a really important paper last summer that came out. Ian Cousins was the first author on it, but where he basically said, let's look at PFAS as a test of this. They were, let's talk about three classes. It's, a, its use is not really needed. I don't really need my new hiking boots to be completely water resistant. Okay? That's okay. I don't need that. So stop using it. The second class is, this is a really important use, maybe an industrial use for something that they really needed to make something. Well, first of all, you better use it so it doesn't escape into the environment, closed system. But second of all, guess what? Maybe there's an alternative, uh, and I should say a safe alternative, something that's actually been tested before it goes on the market. Let's say there's a, so you switch to the safe alternative. And then the third class is, we have no alternative. So there may be certain medical uses, for example. And, you know, that doesn't mean we don't continue to look for alternatives, but you would continue it in that third category. That would be a really small category compared to the tremendous amount of uses um, that otherwise that we have. But, I mean, I think there's got to be, I'm a big believer, it's the market basket speaks. We've got to get people enraged, outraged enough to say, we're just not going to take it anymore. Thank you. I want to thank Linda once more for a fabulous presentation and I think a great kickoff for the conversation today. Um, I also um, want to thank those on the, um, who are joining remotely for sending in questions. Um, we have had a, a request from the remote speakers to have the speakers repeat the question. I'll remind you of that when we get there because they can't hear unless it goes into the mic. Okay, so I'm going to invite our next panelists um, up and as they make their way to the front of the room, um, I'll just do a brief introduction. Um, the Michigan Chemical Company, which was later uh, renamed Valsicol, closed its doors in Michigan in 1978, leaving a toxic legacy of three Superfund sites in our state um, and a residential neighborhood that are still contaminated more than 40 years later. In 1973, the chemical company was responsible for the largest agricultural disaster um, in U.S. history, not just the state of Michigan, but in the country as a whole. They shipped brominated uh, fire retardants, also known as PBB, um, instead of a nutritional supplement, which was then mixed in with livestock feed. Millions of Michigan residents consumed farm product products um, containing PBB as a result of that. Dr. Michelle Marcus and Jane Keon have been working for over, I have here over 25 years, but I think it's longer than that. Um, well, I've been working roughly. for 20 years, but we've been, we've been independently working yes. for more than 25 years and partners for more than 10. Thank you. Um, to understand the long-term health, human health impacts of that contamination, as well as the long-term economic and social implications um, of, uh, of it. I'm delighted to um, welcome them to the podium, and they are going to talk to you a little bit about their work. How do we? While she is doing this, I would like to encourage those who are trying to get PFAS under the Superfund regulations to ask our legislators to include in that bill a, a reinstatement of the Superfund tax. The super, there really is no fund anymore. And um, because there was a Superfund tax on chemical companies, and it was a very small tax but it built up this fund that could be used to clean up sites such as the ones we have in our community where the responsible party was allowed to go home. And I don't know, DOD is acting like a non-responsible party. So, um, <laughs> so um, I think if you could get the Superfund tax reinstated and have an actual fund for these cleanups to draw upon, that's a money source, and it should come from the chemical companies. One person told us that the, the size of the tax on the chemical companies was about equivalent to a family of four ordering one cheese pizza a year. So it's not an onerous tax. So let's get that done. All right. 
<laughs> and one other thing, Linda was talking about um, how to deal year after year after year with all these new chemicals coming along. And I would like to suggest that we, we go back even further to the root of the problem and start requiring chemicals to undergo the same rigorous uh, research and testing that pharmaceuticals go under before they are allowed into the human population. Right now, chemical companies can manufacture anything they want, put it out there, and then later when we come and say it's making me sick, they'll say, well, how can you prove that? You're, you're, you're exposed to so many things. So we need to go back to the beginning and get the regulation that they have to do the research, do the testing, make sure it's safe for whatever use they need it in and it's not gonna hurt people, okay? All right, now the slides. Where are we going? Here? Yeah. Okay, I'm from St. Louis, Michigan, right here. <laughs> We're the geographical center of the Lower Peninsula and if you drive north um, on 127 and start seeing a bunch of windmills, you'll know that's where we live. Min, uh, St. Louis was known for its healing waters for many, many years. And people would come to St. Louis, many well-known uh, senators um, back in the uh, 19th century would come to St. Louis to drink the waters and also take baths in them to heal whatever ailed them. And the picture on, on that side shows an old bottle of uh, the mineral water that was sold. Here's the chemical plant when it was in production, and um, you'll see that there's neighborhood all around and the river right through there. And that big white blotch is a contaminant of some sort going out into the river. Um, Michigan Chemical, which later became Felsicol, was uh, manufactured about 250 different chemical compounds in their lifespan. DDT was one of them. And um, I know some people think that DDT disappeared out of America after Rachel Carson's book came out, but I will show you in a few minutes that it did not, at least in our town. Um, so then when Michigan Chemical became Velsicol Chemical, um, it, it continued manufacturing other things. It stopped with the DDT soon after that, but then it got into PBB. And so that is the epicenter of the PBB disaster. And that was the largest, not only agricultural, but the largest food contamination accident in the United States of America until this day. And hopefully there's nothing bigger. There were about 9 million people living in St. Louis at that time, or in Michigan at that time, excuse me. And, um, and it, when it got into the food chain, as Amy told you, um, we went to the stores, we bought our hamburger, our cheese, our eggs, our milk, and butter, and it all, we, we all got the PBB in our systems that way. Some of you here are old enough to have gotten it that way. And then later, Michelle's going to show how it isn't just you who are exposed, it's your offspring, it's your grandchildren. So um, the best book on the whole PBB disaster is The Poisoning of Michigan. Um, I highly recommend that you read it. So after the PBB disaster, the state of Michigan decided they did not want Velsicol in the state anymore. And Velsicol was able to work out a deal with the federal government and the state government to leave they had to pay a little bit of money to um, buy clay so that the plant site could be covered up. But the 52-acre chemical plant site, everything on it was demolished. The buildings, the towers, the pipes, the railroad tracks, it's all buried right there. A clay cap was put over. A clay wall was put around. Subsequent years, we found that there were gaps in the wall 10 feet wide. So. I don't know how much good it did. Um, and then we were left with warning signs on the fence and a tombstone out there uh, which um, said, do not go on this property because of the chemical and radioactive contamination. And um, it was, as, I sh as you saw in the first picture, it's right in a neighborhood. It's right downtown. It's like one block from downtown. 
So we lived with that tombstone a long time, and if you're interested in more detail about our group and what we've been doing for the last 22 years, um, my book is called Tombstone Town, and it covers uh, the first 16 years of our group and um, tells you the stories, but also gives other groups getting started some ideas from what we went through of how you can handle dealing with the agencies and dealing with, if you have a responsible party, with a responsible party. So um, I'll put that out there. It's available on Amazon and it's called Tombstone Town. So we started the Pine River Superfund Citizen Task Force in 1998. Um, this is the second time around. Remember the first time the chemical company was, the um, chemical site was all just buried and then it leaked into the river and um, we finally got EPA to come back and do some testing of the, of the sediments. And water um, sediments are, if I remember right, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember that it was 250 parts per million in the sediment, they would clean up a body of water, of DDT. And out here in the, in the river around the plant site, there were hot spots of 32,000, 46,000 parts per million DDT. And when they started digging it out, it was like pure product in some places. So this is after, um, you know, the, that beautiful lawn there is part of the buried chemical plant. And um, the first job that we got EPA to do was clean up the sediment in the riverbed. And um, this picture shows uh, the river, but over there where it's dry land, that was also a river. They put sheet piling in to section it off, and um, they dewatered the part that was not too polluted on top, and then as they got down, the water would be piped to that circus tent there, and it was a water treatment plant, and they would treat the water there before it was returned to the river. And then they built that road across, Trucks would go over there and they'd dig out the sediments, truck them back, let them drip dry. Again, the water would go through the treatment plant and then the trucks hauled the dried out sediments to um, hazardous waste facilities around Michigan. We can talk about that later. <laughs> so um, we also had a radioactive site, um, low level radioactive site where they, the chemical plant had buried uh, their filter cake and other wastes out east of St. Louis. And we had to work a long, long time, but we finally got the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to uh, authorize a cleanup of that. And um, that waste was dug up, put in these super sacks. The company that did it had their own train cars. The, the, the waste was trucked or trained out to Utah where they owned their own land down in Rock, and that's where it's buried. So, guess what? We had contamination in our drinking water wells, and um, the main contaminant was PCBSA, which is a byproduct of the DDT manufacturing, and um, uh, it was a long battle. St. Louis City, little city of St. Louis had to take not only Velsicol to court, but on Velsicol's side were the EPA, the, the, the Department of Justice Trust that had been set up for these problems, the Department of Justice, US D DOJ itself. So it was a David against Goliath kind of situation, but it was settled and St. Louis got um, $26.5 million to start finding new uh, water source. Uh, and uh, it took a while because any wells they drilled anywhere near St. Louis just kept drawing that contaminated groundwater in. So they're 10 miles away now and they had to put in new wells 10 miles away and then it's piped all the way to St. Louis. Not cheap, it's about $55 million so far in that. They're not finished yet. Um, so, in the neighborhood around the plant site, people kept finding dead robins and other birds in the, in the late spring, early summer. And um, we tried to get 
uh, at DEQ at that time or EPA to do a study, and uh, they wouldn't. Um, they had their set agenda. They were going to just do this. They were not going to do that. And um, so we actually used some of our money and hired a wildlife toxicologist to come in and do a study. And um, the birds were collected and found to have died of acute DDT poisoning. This is 40 some years after Rachel Carson's book. Okay, that meant that the worms in the ground, the soil was still highly contaminated. And so um, the toxicologist trained a bunch of our residents to do dead bird collections. We did an actual study of, of the dead birds and um, these birds came back healthy from the south and they made it, they built their nest, a lot of them laid eggs and even had some babies hatch. And then the parents died, so everybody died. And um, there was, we had two streets in that neighborhood that had zero nesting success. None of the robins were able to create their young. So as a result, we were able to get 12 blocks of residential yards dug up and uh, replaced with clean soil. PBB and DDT um, in their yards at, at different places were higher than direct contact level. So they couldn't, they, they, they were fenced off with orange snow fencing so that the children wouldn't get in there, or the, the pets. So this is what's going on right now, although this was a, a year ago. Um, there, everything was buried, right? at the chemical plant, including the chemicals. And all of the waste products are down there. They're, they identified with testing um, several hot spots on the plant site. And incineration is often best for a lot of chemicals to just get rid of them. And, but they didn't, these were so volatile and so dangerous including DBCP, if anybody's a chemist here and knows how dangerous that one is, um, and different kinds of napples were down there. So they decided to use this system of underground incineration in a sense. Um, and what they do is they put uh, heating elements down in the ground, 30 feet deep down to the till layer, and heat the ground up to boiling. And then as the gases come up and the liquids come up, they're captured in extraction wells, and then they're run through separate treatment plants. The stack shows where the final steam from the volatiles went out, went out. and then uh, the, all the blue tanks are massive carbon filters that are filtering the water, and then the water's returned to the river when it's done. This is looking down one of the heating wells. I kind of like this picture. So I would go around and talk to Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and, and Alma Woman's Club and all that. And it, before PowerPoints, I'd have these boards and I'd say, okay, here's where we are with the river impoundment, here's where we are with the Breckenridge site and so on. But notice the health study has red ink around it and a star. That's because we couldn't get anybody do, to do a health study and we tried. NIHS turned us down twice. The first time, I, I kind of like this, they said, um, you've never had a health study in your town, so we can't come and do a health study. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, CDC and ATSDR, and we, we, we'd make a little progress and then it would fall and nothing would happen. Part of the problem is St. Louis is 4,500 people. Gratiot County is 40,000 people, and a lot of these studies need 100,000 people minimum. So anyway, then we found, they <laughs> found us, we found them. Um, the Emory re researchers were researching PBB, and uh, ever since 2013, we have teamed up together, and uh, it's very exciting to, to be able to report to the community Yes, this health study was done. Yes, you're right. We do have a real problem with thyroid cancer in this community. You know, um, people still want to know. After all these years, they really want to know, are our health problems due to having lived here and raised our children here? 
and we're able to answer those questions. There's one question that they're working on right now that we hope is going to be good news instead of bad news, and that is a possible way to help your body eliminate the PBB and the DDT from your system. Now I'll turn it over to Michelle so she can talk about that. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Jane. Um, so um, how did I get in, involved in, in this question uh, of PBBs? And, and it was in the early 1990s, and I got involved because of a concern about chemicals in the environment that might be in, impacting our endocrine system. And I was at Emory University, which um, many of you may know is right next door to the CDC. And so I became involved uh, at the National Center for Environmental Health at the CDC. And at the time, uh, this book had just come out, Our Stolen Future, uh, by Theo Colburn, who was a biologist uh, with the National Wildlife Federation. And she was noticing that there were all these reports coming in of uh, immune function problems in uh, wildlife populations with um, feminization of male fish and reptiles. And actually, there were big headlines when someone found uh, you know, reduced penis size in alligators, and that, that got a lot of attention, um, uh, and, and reduced fertility. And so this is really um, a, a follow-on to Rachel Carson, you know, who really warned us against DDT. And um, what, what these authors were telling us about um, is all of the synthetic chemicals that we've made since then, um, and you know, this shows the, just the dramatic rise of all of these novel synthetic chemicals that have entered commerce um, in the last 50 years. And, and it's important to note that these chemicals were synthesized because they had very important uh, industrial uses, um, and they were never meant to be in our bodies, but they get there. And we have to live with the consequences. Um, so at the time, you know, as I said, the, the, these, um, all these effects in wildlife were being noticed. And at the same time, there were trends in human uh, health effects that related to the endocrine system. For example, girls were maturing earlier, and this trend has continued. Uh, there were declining sperm counts uh, across uh, North America and Europe that was uh, documented. There was an increase in uh, urinary and genital uh, defects of, of newborn boys, um, and increases in, in breast and testicular cancer. So uh, what uh, Dick Jackson, who was head, <clears throat> excuse me, of the National Center for Environmental Health at the, t at the time, put together a panel of scientists, uh, both academic scientists and CDC scientists, and asked us to evaluate the literature and tell um, CDC whether this was an eminent threat to public health. And so we, we carefully examined what was known. And, and these are the two, you know, really big chunks of evidence that we had. Um, and there were, you know, some animal toxicology studies, but they weren't really looking at the, the, uh, the critical period of exposure where um, they might be more vulnerable to uh, these chemicals. Um, and so what we suggested is that there be, uh, that we needed a, a human study um, where we could document individual exposure levels so we're not looking at what's happening over time because lots of things are happening over time, not just the increase in synthetic chemicals. And, you know, rats aren't people. We want to see what's happening in people. And um, I had known about this, um, you know, PBB um, horror um, because I had been at Mount Sinai School of Medicine before I came to Emory and worked with the, the great Irving Selikoff, who, who uh, uh, determined that as, uh, asbestos caused mesothelioma, and Phil Landrigan, who was involved in uh, the beginnings of, of studying uh, the health effects of, of PBB, along with Dr. Selikoff. Um, and I said, you know, 
there's like thousands, uh, millions of people who were exposed to PBB, which based on the animal studies, certainly seems to be impacting the endocrine system. Uh, it seems to be acting like a, a weak estrogen. Um, and, you know, what we were particularly concerned about is, uh, you know, uh, the developing child in the womb. And, um, you know, this, uh, we now are aware because, oh my goodness, three minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, we're aware that, you know, uh, a medication that is harmless to an adult uh, can be devastating to a developing child. And the, these chemicals uh, that interfere with the endocrine system, they're like unregulated medicines. Um, and so, um, you know, we've worked closely with the community, and and um, here is uh, you know some quotes from people who were impacted. You know, I didn't know that something that I was exposed to could be passed to my kid. Did I poison my kid? Um, and um, we did look at early puberty, and and sure enough, we found that the girls who were exposed in the womb and through breastfeeding, because this chemical is um, stored in fat, and breast milk has a very high fat content. So in fact, uh, the girls who were exposed in the womb and through breastfeeding had an, their earlier menstrual period. And you know, on average, it was only one year on average. So uh, you know, I talked to the scientists in the room. Um, when you sample a population, you miss the tails. You miss the people. Uh, uh, you know, this, this family was not in our study. But I presented this to the community, and, and a woman came up to me and told me that her daughter had her first period at five. Um, and then these girls are now adults because we're able to follow uh, multiple generations, and they have a, a dose-related increase in the risk of miscarriages, and that, that exposure dose is their mother's blood level at the time that she was pregnant with them. Um, and, and one of our uh, partners um, has said, to this day, I, I grieve for my lost children, and, and she had over 10 miscarriages. Um, we found thyroid disorders, and now you're going to hear these, you know, echoes of what Linda Birnbaum talked about for PFAS. Um, you know, one of our community partners um, had uh, suffered with, with uh, you know, abnormal thyroid function for two years before it was diagnosed. And it, it turns out that he had a high PBB level, and if he had known that he was at increased risk of thyroid problems, if his doctor had known, then he could have been diagnosed much sooner and, and could have been treated. Um, and I should also say that this particular uh, person um, was not a chemical worker. He didn't have high exposure because he worked in the chemical plant. He didn't even live near the chemical plant, but he had a, a family, uh, an uncle, I think, um, who, who lived right across the street from the chemical plant. And as a child, the kids would go play on the property in piles of what they thought were sand. And they would throw it around, they'd climb up and climb down, and it was laced with PBB. And he had very high levels of PBB. So um, we also found that the boys who were exposed in the womb, so we said the girls matured earlier, uh, the boys actually had more problems in the, the, the development of the urinary and the genital tract um, and, and slower growth and pubertal development. So, you know, the development of the endocrine system uh, in, in boys and girls who are different, and they're different because of, uh, mostly because of the balance between estrogen and testosterone, um, both uh, sexes make both um, uh, hormones, but but girls make much more estrogen, boys make much more testosterone. And so when you have uh, an, a chemical that acts like estrogen, it accelerates the girl's development and it slows down the boys. And uh, during this sort of critical period where the male genital tract is developing, the estrogen can interrupt that. 
Um, so we also found, and, and uh, we and, and other investigators who have looked at this population over time have found an increased risk of lymphoma, of digestive system cancers, and uh, of breast cancers. Um, now, you know, as Linda said, in order to look at cancers, you need a very large population, um, and in fact, um, we are, we recently got funded to look at cancer again, um, and we want to look uh, at the largest population that's possible, which is everybody that was originally um, enrolled in the registry. And uh, um, so th the reason that we were able to do all of this research because, is because the state health department had the foresight in the late 1970s to enroll 5,000 people in a long-term registry to monitor the health effects, because nobody knew what the health effects would be. And that's how we have learned everything that I've told you about so far. And now um, we need to do this again to update the data, particularly now that the younger generation is reaching the age where they are developing cancers. And so we can get a much more accurate estimate. Um, and so we are waiting for the health department to approve our application to study the entire cohort once again. Um, for cancers and mortality. Now, we've also tried to understand um, on a molecular level, on a biological level, how this chemical could be causing uh, the health effects that we're seeing. And um, so I'm going to mention briefly um, epigenetics. Now, um, epigenetics uh, is uh, upon the gene. It's how genes are regulated. So you've got the same strand of DNA in every cell in your body. That's why you can send a blood sample to Ancestry.com, and it's your entire DNA sequence, OK? But how do the cells know to, to do their specific job? The blood cells make different proteins than the heart cells, than the muscle cells, and the bone cells. And it's through this regulation of which genes are turned on and turned off in different cells. Okay, so it increases the, the activity of genes. So we looked at what does PBB do to this gene regulation, and in fact we found that it, it stimulates the same genes that estrogen does. And it also impacts immune function, and uh, it Actually, we've seen that the people with high PBB exposure actually have accelerated aging, that their, uh, their cells are acting uh, like they're older than their chronological age. We've also seen changes in the sperm. Uh, and this, you know, uh, raises the question of whether a father's exposure could impact his children and grandchildren. And so we're doing a study right now um, of three generations with the father who's exposed and not the mother. Um, okay, uh, Amy's giving me the eye here. Um, so I just want to say that, uh, you know, PFAS was not the first forever chemical. Um, you know, DDT, dioxins, uh, PCBs, PBPs, they, you know, they all accumulate. They're, res they're resistant to degradation. They have a long half-life in humans. When I was a kid, we would talk about throwing things away. There is no a way for these chemicals. You just move it from one place to the other. And, and we, if we keep making them, they're just going to pile up. So we found that 40 years later, 60% of the people that we tested still had elevated levels. I'm not going to explain the chart because I don't have time. And we're now working with the community to answer their questions. Um, we're developing a continuing medical education course to, to uh, uh, inform uh, healthcare providers. We are doing, as, as Jane mentioned, a clinical trial trying to help people uh, speed the elimination. Um, and, and we're doing this multi-generational study. We know that the children of women who were exposed are directly exposed in the womb and through breastfeeding, but what about the children of fathers who are exposed? Could these epigenetic changes be passed on to their children? 
So, so what have we learned in, in 40 years of research on this population? Um, it's it's uh, a forever chemical transferred from mother to child. It impacts the reproductive system, the thyroid system, cancers. Um, three generations have impacted, and it, it, it changes the way um, we regulate our genes. And, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, one more word about this uh, community partnership, which has changed everything for us, and we, you know, why are we doing this work in the first place? You know, it, it's really to help protect human health. So why aren't we always working with the communities that are impacted to give them the information that they need to protect their health? You know, for example, we need to let people know that they could be at an increased risk of breast cancer. So they don't say, oh, I don't have a family history. Maybe I'll skip my mammogram this year. Don't do it if you lived in Michigan during the time of this disaster between 73 and 75, you probably consumed contaminated food. Um, I want to say one more thing, which is that every community that has dealt with a toxic event, a toxic contamination, has had to fight alone. We're all here in this room because we need to fight together. Yeah. <laughs> And a Amy's going to tell you the rest of the day is how do we do this? How do we strengthen these partnerships and help each other? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say we have asked the impossible of our speakers today to talk about a huge amount of information in a very short period of time. And I really appreciate people trying to slog through. We do have about five minutes for questions and answer. Um, so we'll open the floor for that, including for um, um, folks on the webinar. And just as a reminder to ask our speakers to repeat the question into the mic. OK. Okay, I'll repeat the question, which is, um, you know, the reason we have learned and, and been able to study the, the people who were exposed to PBB is because the State Health Department had the foresight to establish a registry so that people, uh, that we could do surveillance uh, on the long-term health effects. Um, I don't know what has changed, um, and I don't know why there hasn't been an establishment of, of a PFAS exposure registry. Um, there has been uh, establishment of a lead exposure registry in Flint, um, and hopefully that will help us understand not just the, the impact of, of lead on the community, but whether the, uh, the interventions um, to try and reduce the impact of the lead are working so that we can mitigate, again, that's the other important thing, we want to prevent exposures, and if they occur, we want to help the community uh, to mitigate the, the toxic um, consequences of that exposure. So it's very, very important. And when people say, you know, we don't know the health effects of PFAS, you know, besides the fact that Linda pointed out we know a lot about the health effects of PFAS, but we won't know unless a large group of people have their levels measured and followed. That's the only way we will know. Are you still fighting for access to those records? 
Go right ahead, Michelle. Okay, thank you, uh, Jane Ann. Uh, Jane Ann Crowley is uh, one of our community advisors, and we've been working together for, you know, 10 years now. Um, and she asked, um, you know, will we have access to the entire uh, PBB registry? And the answer is, we don't yet know. We have been waiting for over a year uh, to get an uh, approval from the health department uh, to update the cancer uh, data. And uh, they had approved this uh, several times in the past, and that's how we have learned what we have learned, but, but the cancer studies that were done previously, there were only a very small number of, of cancers. You know, there were, I think it was 10 lymphomas, uh, 12 uh, gastrointestinal cancers. Um, our latest uh, breast cancer study had 51 cases of breast cancer, but that was based on data. Um, cancers diagnosed 20 years ago, so we've gotten funding now to update this, and as Linda said, we need the largest population um, in order for this to be uh, most valuable and most precise. And we are waiting. Uh, you said, what's different about the health department? I don't know. They have not yet given us the go-ahead uh, to do this work that has been funded by NIEHS and by um, Emory University uh, in order to, to update the cancer uh, surveillance on this cohort. Well. Thank you, um, Michelle and Jane, for a fabulous presentation. It really, I think, sets the stage again for, um, uh, for the work that we have to do yet. So please join me in thanking them. We're running just a few minutes behind schedule, but we have a break scheduled now, so we'll go ahead and do that. If folks would be willing to come back, maybe just, um, it's 10.30 now. If we could reconvene here at 10.40, um, and then we will go on with our morning's program. Thanks, everybody.
Do it right. Um, I just want just one sec. So we just so we're gonna put it up on the, de on the desktop. Okay. Thank you. Mary. Yeah. Yes. We're gonna load it on the desktop. Turn mic is the most sensitive. Mm -hmm. So the mask is already pretty far up. You can crank it just a little bit. If you hear any kind of buzzing, that's going to mean that it's too loud. So this is where it's sitting at right now. We can do mic master up a little bit. One, two, three. Four, five, six. And that's going to be a little bit louder. So this is the last thing that you want to turn. First thing you want to do is lectern mic, never make it all the way to the top. If that's not loud enough, you can go ahead and start using mic master, okay? Great. Is there another We're all set. Looks like maybe right there. We can go ahead and step that Is there anything else you need to help with? I was loading another presentation. Okay. Thank you. Here if it's E. I'll try this one. No. That one's already. What about what about well actually let me do this. There. That one, C? Uh, I'm not, no, it's probably it's either E or F. You see it on there? Yep, that's it. So if you go to just hit date modified. 
Okay, that's the that one. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, that one. <laughs> that's all my different presentations, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, you're welcome. It's not going well. It's not? I plugged in and it's Oh, let me find Meredith. Okay, folks. If folks could start to make your way back in and find your seats, I think we're going to pick up again with the rest of the morning's program.
having so many technical problems. And that's right. It's the technical stuff that is so perfect. Where should I put it here? Yeah, just put it over on the desktop. Okay, folks, we're going to get started again. Uh, we're trying to, I know I did that already, but if folks could make your way in, find your seats. Um, and I'm going to quickly introduce our next panel. Um, do you guys want to just come on up? Okay, I'm going to very quickly introduce the moderator for this next stage of the um, morning's event. Uh, Brittany Fremian is an assistant professor at the Central Michigan University. She is an environmental oral historian. Um, and among um, other things, she has been doing oral histories with residents of Michigan who experienced the PBB crisis and its aftermath. So she is going to be the moderator um, for the next session here. So Brittany. All right. Oh, good. It's on. I am so honored to be here in the company of so many community members and researchers and public officials who have dedicated their lives to addressing large-scale chemical contaminations, not only in our state, but across the country. So thank you so much for all of your work and advocacy and efforts. It's just phenomenal and so necessary. I'm delighted to introduce two um, individuals who have played a really important role in addressing contamination in the state of Michigan over the past 40 some years. Um, Francis Bus Spaniola represented Shiawassee County in Mich the Michigan House of Representatives from 1975 to 1990. He's actually um, the uh, individual, the representative who has been the longest serving representative in, in that area in, in Michigan history. So that's a wonderful thing to have had an advocate um, serving for that long for Michigan communities. He sponsored the legislation which lowered the PBB levels, instituted uh, a public health study regarding the human health impact of PBB, and provided low to sorry, low to no interest loans to PBB distressed farmers. I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of farmers who have actually mentioned how critical um, all of those have been um, and remain to, to them. So um, among many awards, the Booth Newspapers named him one of Michigan's 10 best legislators in 1978. He's Legislator of the Year by the Michigan Association of Regions in 1986 and the Legislative Leadership Award by the Area Agency on Aging Region 1B in 1989. He's a native of Corona, Michigan, a graduate of Corona High School, and Michigan State University, where he earned a BA in political science. He did his graduate work at MSU as well, and was a fellow at the Robert Taft Institute of Government at MSU. In addition to these accolades, he's a former commissioned officer in the United States Army. He's taught history, yay, and government <laughs> <laughs> at high schools in East Lansing, Durand, and Corona. He was appointed by Governor Jennifer Granholm to serve two years on the Library of Michigan Board of Trustees and Michigan Judges Retirement Board. He served uh, on the staff of U.S. Senator Donald Regal um, and was a member of the board and president of the Friends of Michigan History and Commander Region 9 of the Military Order of the World War. So he is a very distinguished individual and, and thank you us for being here today. He's joined by his son, Tony, who is an attorney and partner in the firm that he founded with Bob Eufer in 1987, uh, Eufer, Spaniola, and Frost. His practice is focused on the representation of corporate and other business entities in a number of contexts. 
Tony has previously been active in politics and government, and you'll hear today some more about how he helped his father run successful campaigns for the Michigan House of Representatives and has worked for various other government officials, including the Secretary of Transportation for the state of Massachusetts. He also is a former news reporter and radio announcer, which I was delighted to hear. In the wake of Michigan's PBB public health crisis, Tony initiated legislation that helped to create the Michigan Cancer Registry to promote and facilitate epidemiological research in the state. In 2004, he served as a legal work group advisor to the Governor's Commission on Mental Health. And most recently, those of you who were here for the documentary last night, no defense, um, you know that he has been very involved in advocating for community members in Oscoda County and across the state, across the country, who are dealing with PFAS con contamination. So thank you, Tony, for being here as well. Okay, bus, can I start with you? All righty. I wondered if you would be willing to talk a little bit about your involvement in the efforts to address PBB contamination in the 1970s. In particular, as I mentioned, you're credited with encouraging the, the state to lower the PBB levels as well as um, initiate a long-term health study and provide critical financial assistance to farmers. How did you decide to tackle these issues and how did you go about it? Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me out there. Well, to be brutally honest with you, uh, when I was elected to the legislature in November 1974 and took office the 1st of January 1975, uh, I didn't even know what PBB was. I hadn't heard of it, and I come from an agricultural district. And uh, didn't hear about it in the campaigns, and uh, you know, I uh, honestly re tried very hard to be up to date on the issues, and, and I, I was unaware of it. But I was appointed to the uh, Agriculture Committee uh, of the House of Representatives, which was chaired by a couple of uh, other Democrats, if you will. <laughs> so you know what my politics were. Uh, uh, and these two guys were farmers. And one was a man by the name of Don L. Basta, and the other one was a man by the name of Paul Porter. And they were co-chairs of that committee. And it's because of uh, the activities on that committee that I became you know, knowledgeable about the problem. But uh, Congressman Elbost, well, Representative Elbost at that time, uh, took the lead in, in uh, opening up the PBB issue and uh, had a number of public hearings across the state. And by the way, we had a lot of difficulty getting those off the ground uh, for all kinds of political reasons, which we do not have time for here. But in any event, uh, uh, I attended those meetings and uh, you know, listened to the quote experts, and I listened uh, very, very carefully to those people who were considered non-experts, and uh, interestingly enough, the ones that were affected by it who were told they didn't know what they were doing, okay? And uh, as I went across the state and listened to both sides, it became very clear to me who was telling the truth, <clears throat> and frankly, it wasn't the experts, excuse me. Uh, it wasn't that they were bad people, but they were people who were trying to protect their jobs. And they were influenced by, you name it, money, whatever, okay? Well, anyway, uh, I, uh, I went to hearings. Of course, my son attended many of them with me, my wife as well. And what really opened the door, what opened my eyes, I should say, is listening to the ordinary folks, if that's a proper term, telling about their problems. And you know that it was such a serious problem and no one was listening to them that on Sundays when they knew I was at home, people that were not constituents of mine would come to my door and they would come in with their families and they would tell stories that were so, so sad that, uh, you know, I, uh, honest to God, cried many times. Well, I got very interested in the issue. Uh, Representative Elbasta was uh, uh, obviously leading the, the, the 
the pack at this particular stage. And uh, he decided to run for US Congress. And then there was a, a mix, a, a split within our own party. And uh, it fell on me actually to take up the fight. And that's how I got involved. And uh, of course, as, as you well know, uh, you've heard all about the problems before, but I, I saw them face to face and heard these people. And I want to tell you something. It had a profound impact on me. You know, listen sometimes to those people who are supposedly not the experts. I'm telling you, it had an impact on me, a big one, and that's how I got involved. Yeah, I think that is really important that you helped to kind of amplify those community voices, and you really heard and responded to the concerns that you heard. Okay, so Tony, you were a young adult when your father spearheaded these efforts to address PBB contamination. In what ways do you think that his work on that issue affected you, in particular, um, how PBB might have informed your decision to work with the Cancer Registry and now with PFAS? Well, thank you. Um, what, what I saw when I was 18 years old, uh, trailing around with my dad in the state was, as he said, I, I, the stories were just horrible. Um, the p real life people who were su just suffering terribly and not only, uh, in many cases, the farmers, they were losing their livelihood. Uh, they were ill, they were sick. And on top of it all, they had people from our state agencies telling them they were all crazy. Hypochondriacs, uh, psychosomatic, uh, just the most, some of the most disgusting things I've ever seen in my life. And to hear, uh, I, there's one particular time I went with my dad up to Cadillac for a hearing, and the farmers, uh, one by one, stood up and started telling, I mean, <laughs> just awful things that were happening to them. And the, and the state folks would say, oh, you know, we don't see any evidence of anything. And, you know, I'm, I was no expert in any regard, but it just made no sense why people would go up and humiliate themselves in front of a large crowd of people and be <laughs> to, for glory. They were called glory seekers. It was just, it was amazing. Uh, and, and I remember the stories. I remember one man in particular outside the hearing, we actually in the restroom, and he pulled up his shirt sleeves and showed me these lumps around his elbows and then pulled up his pant legs and showed me lumps around his knees. And he said, those aren't in my head. Um, I, that's, that's stuck with me my entire life. And um, so, I mean, it was an amazing opportunity for a young man to be able to see this. Um, we went to um, all sorts of hearings all over the place, but then, 40 years later, to find out that my family has been impacted by PFAS and we can't drink our water, uh, all of that informed everything I've done ever since. Um, I, 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 th that perspective, I think, guides everything that I do. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you both what you think the most important lessons you've learned from both the PBB episode and or PFAS might be. Well, one of the things I learned that I'm not too happy with is that uh, we don't learn much. <laughs> Yogi Berra said it well. It's like deja vu all over again. I mean, for God's sake, we, you know, we, we should have been prepared at least to deal with this second round, uh, as I call it. <laughs> in a little different fashion than we have. And it would seem to me that we would have learned something about uh, how to deal with the uh, people that, uh, the experts that attack the other experts that are telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that we would also learn something about uh, political action and if there's anything that I see that's not being addressed today is how to take what you know and what you know from the experts 
and how to take that and to turn it into a political weapon, if that's the proper term, to get the people in public office who will make the difference to do something. We haven't learned how to do that. We haven't learned how to do that. Where, where, where are we? As one, one old man who used to come into my dad's store would say, what do you hear from your head? Okay? And for crying out loud, is pure water and pure food a political issue? It's not a partisan issue. And we need, we need to take people, have people like you be, become equipped not only to deal with the, the issue itself, but to deal with the politics of the issue effectively. Also, well, following on that, um, I'm in a, my, my family's place that's impacted by PFAS is in a little tiny town. St. Louis, you, you guys are, we're right with you. Same size pretty much. No media, uh, no coverage, no nothing for seven, eight, nine years. And so when I got, learned that we were impacted, I knew immediately from the PBB experience, because what happened with PBB was all political. It was political pressure that, caught, that, that forced things to happen. It took too long as my friends in St. Louis know all too well, but that's what made the difference. And so I hear people in the, in the PFAS world saying, oh, don't get political about this. I say baloney. It's all political. Uh, the only way we're gonna make things happen is to force legislation through Congress, to force the regulators to take action. And as Michelle Marcus said earlier, we all need to come together because we're in this together. Little tiny towns like St. Louis and Oscoda and Grayling and Alpena, you know, Oh, separately, we're not much, but together we're a powerhouse. And so that's what I learned from PBB, and that's what we all need to learn as we move forward, particularly this afternoon when we can all get together and powwow and figure out how to tackle this stuff. Thank you both for your past work and your ongoing work. I think we have a, a little bit of time for some questions. We have a few minutes for questions for our um, opening um, And again, if we we'll get questions, if we need, you would repeat them. Sure. Oh, right here. Okay. Right here. Uh, hi, I'm Teresa Landrum, and I'm from Southwest Detroit. My question is, we know that this issue is widespread. How do we get our legislatures to move? Because we've been working hard and they seem to ignore us. They no longer work for us. It seems like we work for them. And, and it's been a difficult situation. And this bipartisanship is breaking us down. And it, it is, it, this is life or death. And that's the challenge we have with our own legislatures that we've elected to protect us. I, I agree. I, I agree, Teresa. And the, the, the question is, what do we do to get our legislators to act? And because it's been a long time and it doesn't seem like things are happening. And I'm with you there 10,000%. In Oscoda, we've been at it 10 years, 10 years. We don't even have a plan to clean it up. And so what, you know, all we can do is to come together, find those people in the legislature who will listen to us, because they are there. I mean, the Winnie Brinks from Grand Rapids is fantastic on this issue, and just one of many people. Our, our congressional folks, you, you find those levers to pull, and then you join together as communities and with them to partner. And we've done that in Oscoda. We have a long ways to go, but we want to partner with you in Detroit. Monica Luce Patrick has been up to our community, and we're going to keep fighting. So let's, let's get together and talk some more. You know, if, if I may, as individuals, you're, you're far more powerful than you think politically. And let me tell you from my own experience, uh, well, let me back up just one step and say something that I did learn uh, in Lansing. I'm not sure I like it, but 
You know what's most important to a legislator? Get reelected. Okay? So you take that and you use it. What worked, what worked with me particularly was when ordinary folks would come to my office and sit down and tell me their story. And if it registered as being legit, it stuck there. And I was telling someone earlier today, those individual visits may not seem that important to you, but to me, it registered here. And every day when I went on the floor to deal with the legislation that was scheduled that day, I'd look at the list of things that were on the agenda, and I would look, at, look down there and see there's an issue that, oh, a couple of my constituents came and talked to me about. I'd go pull the file. I'd take it down to the floor with me. And listen, it had an impact. Because I believed those people, OK? And I also knew if I responded to them, they would talk to other, well, they'd talk to other people and maybe help me get reelected. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's not as tough as you think. And I was telling someone earlier here, and I'll, and I'll wrap up very quickly. You know, all of the scientific information that you get is very important. But you need, you need to have a couple of meetings like this to talk about how to be effective politically, because that's where the answer is here. That's why we keep seeing this stuff over and over again and people making the same mistakes over and over again. You're more powerful than you think. Believe me. Believe me. From the Middle East, I'm telling you the problem with contamination caused by U.S. military bases is not restricted to the United yes. States. Yes. It is actually, it's actually a massive, massive global problem. The research I've done in the past few years shows that one military base in Iraq, which we had access to because there was uh, 500 of them and there is no access to them, uh, we have shown that there is a link between distance to the military base and occurrence of birth defects and level of thorium in blood of children. So what you do here, I think your uh, agenda should be to confront and force U.S. Department of Defense to clean up the mess that it leaves all over the world. The anger towards the United States is rooted in the fact that many, many millions of people's lives have been turned around and destroyed by the fact that the U.S. is literally present in multiple places. Thank you for your work. All right. I think that motivates us to keep moving. And um, our next conversation is, Bus, what did you call them with uh, the people who don't know anything? <laughs> Um, the people who, who do know something, um, because they live in communities that have experienced large-scale chemical contamination. And I want to invite uh, folks who are part of the, our next panel to um, begin to move um, uh, up to the front. And just to flag for us, we are really, in this conference, are using PBB and PFAS as kind of bookends for large-scale chemical contaminations. There are a number of others that have um, um, happened in Michigan. Um, and we have representatives on the panel from Detroit who, who have experienced large-scale brownfield contaminations throughout the city. And I believe, is Yvonne Lewis here? Um, from Flint, um, who can talk about the contamination of the water in Flint. I think I'm going to go round up Yvonne, and I'm going to turn it over to, um, thank you, I'm going to turn it over to Angela Reyes, um, for, who is the founding and executive director of Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation, who's going to moderate this next section. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have the honor of moderating a panel of um, ordinary people who have done extraordinary things. 
um, and who have been living um, on the front lines with the, the results of large-scale contamination. Um, so we're going to be having um, a discussion amongst the panelists, and then there'll be time for question and after, uh, questions and answers afterwards. Uh, so let me just briefly um, give you the names of the folks who are on the panel, and then they will have um, an opportunity to introduce themselves a little bit more. Um, so we have Teresa Landrum, who is a community activist from Southwest Detroit from the zip code of 48217, which is the farthest southwest corner of the city, surrounded by a number of industrial sites, including Marathon. Um, Edward Lawrence from the Pine River Superfund Citizens uh, Task Force and Alma College. Tim Nayer from the PBB Citizens Advisory Board. Um, Lawrence Reynolds from Flint was sick um, with an upper respiratory infection because um, it's going around. So Yvonne Lewis has gracefully agreed to step in at the last moment. Who's going to, uh, we told her, you live and breathe this stuff. You can fill in. And she is um, also from Flint, Michigan, is a community resident and the founder of the National Center for African American Health Consciousness. Um, Danelle Wilkins from the Green Door Initiative in Detroit, Michigan. Sandra Weinstelt from Rockford, Michigan, a resident from there. Uh, so we have a very robust uh, panel from across uh, the state of Michigan who have experienced some of these issues firsthand. Um, so uh, first I would like each of the panelists, maybe starting um, on the far end there, um, and to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit more about um, yourself, how you got into this work, and some of the issues that your community has been facing around contam chemical contamination. Okay, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Sandy. How did I get into this work? I accidentally backed into it, I think. Um, my story is that I'm from Rockford, Michigan, little town north of Grand Rapids, and um, my husband and I moved there in 92 and bought what we thought was the perfect home. It was surrounded by Christmas trees. Who doesn't want to live in a Christmas tree farm? Um, we lived there for almost 25 years. In 2016, um, my husband was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer and died three weeks later. And if any of you have lost someone, you know it's, um, it's devastating. It's like trying to tie your shoes with one hand. You can't do it. Um, but you kind of move forward. Um, the next year, the DEQ came to my house and said, out of an abundance of caution, we would like to test your water for this thing called PFAS. And I thought, they're probably checking for Cheerios. I don't know what PFAS is. Knock yourself out. I'm kind of bored here. Come and test my water. And they came back about three weeks later, and I knew when they pulled in with a team of workers um, that it was probably not good, because I've worked in government long enough to know that if more than three show up at your door, they're not handing you the publisher's clearinghouse. So they told me the rates in my groundwater at that time were 27,000 parts per trillion, and they thought that was an error because it was too high. So they tested again and it came back at 38,000 parts per trillion. It's tested as high as 88,000 parts per trillion. My blood is tested at 5 million parts per trillion. I'm 750 times higher than the average person. That's not an award. You don't get a gold medal for that. It's just a fact of life. So when that happened, I met my neighbors, and I met my congressmen, and I figured out that this is insanity. We don't need to live like this. So that's my story. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Teresa Landrum. I am from a zip code, 42217. We have been deemed the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan. And that reason being because I live among more than 33 heavy polluting industry, and I live right down the street from the only oil refinery in the state of Michigan. I got involved in 1985 unknowingly when we in Southwest Detroit learned that the closed Detroit Salt Company was bought and the new owners wanted to store 
toxic waste in the mine shafts of the salt mine. Um, I was um, uh, in the master mechanic department of General Motors at the time, and I heard about it. So I went and I asked questions, and people didn't even know that this was going to occur. It all resulted in me being one of three people to go before the Detroit City Council to ask why and how could they allow something like this to happen. Once they started to name some of the chemicals that would be stored in that mine shaft, it, it was just mind blowing. And we live below the water table. We live in what we con are they consider a flood zone. And we live on the side of the Rouge River, which you know has been named one of the most contaminated rivers in the state of Michigan, which is a tributary to the Detroit River, which is a tributary to St. Clair, uh, Lake St. Clair, which is our freshwater source. Um, so we were able to fight and tell them that salt was a corrosive once those chemicals were stored there. And if we had a rise in the water table and it flooded, that water could then leach into the Rouge River, which would go, therefore, to the Detroit River. And um, I want to say something about PBP. I first learned about PBP when there was the issue when the livestock was poisoned. Well, I also learned at that time that in the transformers that are on your light poles and in, in back of your house that had PPP in it. Well, we in my community had had a series of electrical fires where every transformer down one city block blew up, the stuff oozed out into the ground, and therefore contaminated our alleyway and our backyard. But unlike Sandy, no one came to our house. No one notified us. We were never tested. And just to move forward, I had become active. I was pushed, drug, and rolled into the environmental justice movement. <laughs> and uh, so it, it was out of necessity because of the chemicals that we have been exposed to from surrounding industries. My area is um, in non-attainment for sulfur dioxide as well as ozone. So we started a community monitoring group where we were one of the first communities to get a stationary monitor from then MDEQ. Because all the times we were telling MDEQ we're being exposed, we want a health impact assessment, we want a cancer cluster study, we want um, our blood tested, they told us there was no need for it. So listening to the stories today and watching the movie last night, this is the same thing that occurred to us 40 years ago that is still happening to this day. So that's how I became involved. It's so hard to follow Teresa. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Donnell Wilkins, and I am the uh, founder of uh, a Detroit-based group called the Green Door Initiative. How did I get involved in this work? Um, so well over 30 years ago, I was working in the space of occupational health and safety. And uh, I like to say I'm a born advocate, um, found myself working with labor, um, and really became very motivated by the fact that people in my community really enjoyed um, retirement. And if they retired after working for many years in the most dangerous, low paying work, um, they, their health failed. I'm also um, the daughter, my father, my stepfather, um, was, had worked for Chrysler. And he was in his early 30s. He's on his way from work after doing a, a long shift. And uh, he has a massive heart attack on the way home. And as a result, he uh, then ended up with, in a car accident, and that ultimately ended his life, which actually caused um, my family, my mother, to be a widow of six children and left her as a uh, single mom. So fast forwarding, when I got involved in workplace health and safety stuff, it occurred to me that I needed to find out why my dad uh, lost his life so early in his life. And... Um, which really led me to be approached by someone from this institution, Dr. Uh, Bunyan Bryant, 
um, who was familiar with my work uh, because the focus was on black workers' health and safety, and that was kind of rare uh, back then. And he said, you're the kind of person we need to attend this important meeting that's going to take place in Washington, D.C. in 1991, the first People of Color Environmental Leadership Conference. And it was the first time that uh, a massive group of people from all over this country, including Alaska, Puerto Rico, uh, Hawaii, the southern parts of, of this country, Savannah, Chicago, Detroit, Native Americans, all converged on Washington, D.C. to redefine the environmental movement. Uh, to really include people who had been sort of invisible in this work, particularly when it comes to exposure to toxins, and not being sort of involved in the policy making processes that would protect their, their rights, to afford them the opportunity to have equal protection under the law when it comes to environmental protection. The number one reason for that was the color of our skin. And we have experienced too many deaths, too many deformities, too many um, things, as was mentioned even earlier, uh, disparate impacts and whatever, because of the color of our skin, because of the racist policies for discriminatory policies for where um, polluting facilities and whatever would be located um, as a result of um, residential um, apartheid in our country. The color of your skin dictates where you get to live. And then uh, too many times, like in the case of 4217, industry grows up around it. And until lives become um, something that everyone who enters this earth gets to enjoy, uh, regardless of the zip code they live in, the color of their skin, um, the income level, until that is something that is ignored, that honors our personhood as human beings, we are, uh, I'm doing this fight for environmental justice to reverse that. So I've been working in that space for well over 30 years, um, trying to uplift this work. Uh, I'm excited about being in this room and in this space today because as I also viewed that film yesterday and listened to the stories, I'm like, it's the same old story. And we've been fighting it for a long time. And we've been fighting it by ourselves. And most people have just kind of said, oh, that's a Detroit issue, or those are black people issues. That's not our issue. That doesn't reflect the environmental movement. That's not our issue. We're all human beings. And it's not OK that we can't breathe the same air, drink the same uh, clean water, um, for our children to be in school buildings that are uh, contaminated and have issues, to be located near freeways. Uh, there's a multitude of issues. How I got in this, I'm a born advocate, and it's my job while I'm in this space, in this earth, I have to do what I can to speak my truth and to fight for it and to change laws. I'm looking forward to working with all of you across this state. It's about time we get it together and remove the false barriers, the false walls, like racism, whatever, and say we all deserve to have this quality of life. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Nyer. Uh, I live near Mount Pleasant, Michigan, which is in Isabella County. Um, I got involved in this some 46 years ago when I was 20 years old working on our farm. I think I'm the only one in our uh, cohort that would be like the survivor of the atomic bomb when it dropped. And because our farm was the one uh, it got uh, quarantined, and all of our animals were taken, uh, were tested. Um, they had levels anywhere from five parts per million to 23, 26 parts per million. So every living animal on our farm had to be destroyed. And that happened on April 12th of 1975. The feed went out of that pallet mill that we bought out of Battle Creek in 1973 or 1974. So we got contaminated, I believe, at the onset of it. And so for like 18 months, we were milking our cows and shipping our milk to Everett Dairy 
and they supplied all the My uh, Meyer stores in Michigan with fluid milk. Now, what it gets really complicated in uh, mind-boggling was they quarantined us in April. That means no animal could leave the farm, nothing. However, they quarantined us for two weeks, and they came back to the Department of Agriculture and said, well, you might not get a settlement right away, or you know, it might be a long time, and we know you don't have any money because you, know, you can't sell your milk, but uh, we're going to test your milk, and as long as it stays below uh, 0.3 parts per million, you can sell your milk. So they temporarily let us milk our cows, sell, our, sell the milk up until June 5th of 1975. That's when eight trucks came there, and they had to wait until the milk truck pumped the milk off before they could back in and load the cattle up to take them up to the killing site. And I just thought, this, this can't be. I says, why are you, if the cattle aren't fit to eat, why are we allowing us to sell them. And the story was, well, we don't know about it, and this is such an unusual thing, and we don't know how to handle it, and we're just going by what information we have right now. That upset me. So from that point on, I uh, collected every article on PBB. I went to every meeting that was around there. Uh, and Farm Bureau, where we bought our 412 dairy pallet, um, I don't think was forthcoming as much as they could because when it came out in 74, we would go into the elevator and ask them, hey, did we get any of this feed that they're talking about? And the, the man, oh no, that's, that's just a small issue down the state. That's, you know, you don't have enough worry about or anything. And they kept feeding this, this uh, line to us. So, you know, wh what are you to believe? Until the uh, state inspector from the, uh, milk plant came in and pulled your permit down. Then, then it got real serious. Um, they um, would, <sighs> we had to file a lawsuit in order to get a rapid uh, escalation of our claims and stuff. And then of course we went through the whole process and stuff. And uh, at the settlement, they said, well, we asked them, well, what about our health? Oh, don't even bring that up. That's off the table. Nobody knows anything about it. It's not an issue. So uh, don't even bring it up. We're not, you ain't going to get a dime for it. So um, they did. The state came in and had the Silikoff uh, team come in. They came into Grand Rapids. Um, my family enrolled in it. We went down there on a Saturday, and it was an all-day process. Uh, they took my blood and some fat tissue. Uh, I tested 1.2 parts per million in my uh, fat tissue, and I had a half a uh, half point uh, PB or uh, parts per million in my blood. That was in 1976. Fast forwarded to, what was it, 2012, when you guys started it up. I get a letter from um, the advisory group, and I thought, wow, what a nervous idea. We have a group of people that are actually getting together and seeing what you can do to get rid of the PVB in your body. You would go to the doctor and say that to my local doctor, and they just, they didn't know anything about it. They just tell me, oh, don't worry about it. So. Um, we got, um, uh, got involved in that, and um, it just goes to show that um, as part of this thing, I always said um, there's one element that they don't measure that you can't measure in parts per million, and that's the collateral damage that did to families, uh, it caused divorce, it caused uh, problems between families, brothers, brothers. There's lots, a lot of issues that nobody talks about that was an issue that never gets reported and never gets married, or 
uh, exposed. So um, I collected, like I said before, I collected all this information. I don't know how many pounds of information I had, but I donated it to uh, CMU uh, Library. So if anybody wants to do any research with the actual uh, articles and stuff that were written at the time and what was said then and stuff is, is at Central Michigan University for everybody to do research on. And I think that's the least I can do. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Ed, so uh, I'm from uh, Alma, St. Louis. Uh, we're sort of like the Twin Cities of Michigan, you know. Um, and uh, I, I came here, I wasn't here when we had the, the, the PBB mistake. We lived in Chicago. I vaguely recall seeing on TV cattle getting shot, uh, which was dramatic. But I uh, came here in 89 uh, to teach at Alma College, the social history and uh, public policy. And uh, thought I'd be dealing with places like maybe Flint or Detroit, uh, where there were, it seemed to have a lot of social or economic problems, not Alma. I, we lived there a year, and in uh, 1990, I went to, to a conference at MIT on problems in the American economy. And the first morning of this conference, I sat in the front corner chair, and the guy running the session came in and said, um, why don't we, you know, before we start talking, why don't we go around and introduce ourselves? And he pointed at me, he said, why don't you say who you are, where you're from? I said my name, I'm from Alma, Michigan. And a guy in the middle of the, the group, the symposium, interrupted and said, if we want to study problems in the American economy, we had to go to this guy's hometown. And I was like, wait a minute, I didn't say Flint, I, you know, where there were economic problems, clearly, uh, you know, uh, or, or Detroit. And, and then he explained for about 10 minutes the history of Velsa Coal Chemical, the PBB incident, the total irresponsibility of the company, its terrible labor relations is really amazing. I live in this place. And, and so I came back, uh, started a project with some students. I was sort of talking to people who had been uh, involved, what was then 20 years earlier in the PBB incident. And as we did this in the mid 90s, we found out there were these just tragic stories, amazing stories of sort of failure of the policy process and, and all this. And then to make a long story short of uh, my life in this, in 1997, EPA came back into town, uh, having found how contaminated uh, our river was with DDT. They offered to uh, uh, reopen uh, remediation, which they started in 1998 and specifically related to health, because we had heard all these stories of people being concerned about the health consequences of exposure. Uh, one of the first things we did in 1999 was file, <laughs> really at the edge of our competence, file a massive grant proposal to NIEHS, not to pick on NIEHS, it was different leadership at that time than more recently. Uh, we were turned down because we didn't have a community group to participate. And we were like, we're a community group. You know, but what they really were looking for was big name universities, not to pick on places, you know, some of you are from. Uh, they wanted those to be fun, to be doing proposals. They didn't want a community initiating this. And there was a question earlier about why has things changed? Well, things had changed already by then compared to the 70s. Michigan was much poorer as a state with the decline of the auto industry and other changes. And our health department had law on the state level level had lost uh, both assets and uh, personnel and money, and um, they had no interest in supporting our health study. I, it is so tragic we didn't do it. We, what we were proposing was to use infant blood spots, if you know about those, or collected all newborns, and analyze for exposures to PBB and DDT. And this was rejected. Uh, by NIEHS, and then the state went ahead and destroyed the old records, and so we can't even do what we would have proposed, what we would have wanted to do at that time. So I guess I found out from all this, and it's a much longer story uh, than what I'm just saying, how uh, it, there really is a fundamental problem. There has been one in um, 
uh, you know, dealing with these major issues. And one last thing, one observation that we made after a few years of fighting for this was, you know, there's this sort of environmental saying that you should think globally and act locally, okay? Um, we decided that is opposite, that is wrong. What you have to do is think globally. So we got a problem in Escoto, we got a problem in, you know, Mount Pleasant, we have a problem in Flint. So get familiar with that. Become an expert on your local problem. But if you just hang on there and focus locally, you're going to be beaten by the forces way beyond you who don't want action and have much more assets. What you have to do is become experts on your local problem and then, you know, fight, you know, for an alliance across the board to confront this. And, and when you're thinking, it's not just geographically, it's especially economically. The economics of our policy is totally flawed. We are not assuming the cost of all the suffering from the endocrine disruptions, from the lost lives of the miscarriages. None of that gets factored into talking about the environmental problem, uh, even the public health problem. So you have to think geographically across the board, but I think you also have to think about the economics confront the economic model that justifies a lot of people suffering in the name of, well, we need it for growth, you know, and uh, you say a lot more about that, but I better stop and give the chance. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yvonne Lewis, and I am a 40-year resident of Flint. But as I sat and listened earlier, thinking about the conversation at this panel and the question of when did I get started in this, probably got started in this at birth. Uh, I was born into a family of activists. I was actually born in Saginaw, Michigan, so the PBB conversation is very real to me uh, because that was a part of my growing up and always concerned about what will the long-term impacts of this be. But I guess I would have to say 1987 was a pivotal point because I left 15 years as a salaried employee with General Motors to try to figure out what I could do to make a difference in my communities. That led me to begin working in partnership with faith communities, my dad was a pastor, and community organizations and academic partners. And so, I really developed a passion to say, where are the voices that are missing from these tables? So I want to say this before I go too far and I forget, that the community voices are so very, very important. The lived experience brings a level of expertise that must be heard, which requires listening and being at the table, part of the conversation at the table, not just on the table as a matter of discussion and part of projects to get to solutions. The lived experience is critically important. So as I was sitting at the tables and I was listening to some of the conversations, I wondered often, who are we talking about? Or I said, I said, who are they talking about? Because it didn't reflect the community that I lived in. It didn't reflect the people that I knew. It didn't reflect my lived experience. And so many years later, after many academic partnerships and conversations, the National Center for African American Health Consciousness was born because in 1987 was my first exposure to anything public health as a profession. In 1987, I learned about Healthy People 2000. And then I learned about Healthy People 2010. And then in 2013, I was looking at the information about Healthy People 2020. And what I realized at that moment is that when I looked at the statistics and the data related to African American health and health outcomes, it didn't change very much at all except for getting worse. And I attribute that to the importance of not really understanding what the data means. What does it really say? And then what do we learn from it? So I encourage as we're having this conversation and I hear these wonderful voices, these partnerships are so extremely important. So we get to the water crisis in Flint. And it is not ended, it is not over. 
because for us, it will be a lifetime experience, much as what you've heard here. We wonder what will happen to the, to the, to the women of childbearing age. We don't understand what the implications of that will be. We talk about a lot the research that's going on and how this research is being conducted and what will it really mean to the residents. And I think it's important to have those voices at the table to determine the type of research that will be done and what are the questions that we want to have answered. So one of the things we did in Flint was we started the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. That was our effort to bring community and academic partners together in an equal kind of way so we can all be a part of talking about what the research will be. You, you all know we had researchers coming from everywhere. And this isn't new to Flint. As you said, people have been wanting to come to Flint for a long time. <laughs> so it isn't new to Flint. But the resistance of a community, when we were told that everything was okay, community members knew it wasn't okay and intentionally said it isn't okay and brought the evidence. But because they weren't considered, quote unquote, the expert or the scientist, the evidence was not received or accepted. But it was credible. The other thing is our Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. This, again, is a community academic partnership where community members are at every part of the decision-making process. And when we talk about community engagement, I heard it spoken about earlier, community engagement. We know that in certain cases, community members might not be there at the beginning of the conversation, but it is important to consider how they can be involved and included in those conversations for the best or most optimal outcome for everybody involved. Speaking about, again, the Flint water crisis. It is so challenging to think every day. Not only are you having to figure out if you turn on the tap, can you use the water? There are other contaminants in the water than lead. Lead got us attention. And at times it feels like lead is also our Achilles heel. Because when we can regulate something, we can say we fixed it and everything is okay. But it, there's no safe lead level, right? But then you add that to PBB, and then you look around and now we have PFOS leaking into the river. We have multiple sites that are contaminated because General Motors did leave them. We are thankful that the requirement at the federal level during the bankruptcy caused them to put something together called the Racer Trust to help remediate those, those properties, but it's still there. And the residents have to face every day the question, what do we do to help ensure we do our best to prevent further complications and also mediate what's going on and then what's it gonna look like for our future. So this is a long-term conversation. We don't have enough time to talk about it all right now, but we welcome the opportunity to continue conversations and I encourage you, for those of you that are really, really, and I know you are because you're here, interested in making a difference, just be sure you are engaging members who are living this experience in the conversations so those nuances that you would never think about come forward so the change that's necessary can be made. I told you they were extraordinary. Um, so I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of Detroit as well and live in southwest Detroit in the zip code just adjacent to where Teresa lives. We recently had um, another contamination that happened on the riverfront where uranium and now PFAS is probably in, in the river just upstream from the, um, the water intake for our um, wa waste, waste water treatment plant. And uh, we're being told that there is no um, effect on health and the water is fine. So I'm wondering with some of you folks, some of you have mentioned this, what kind of information were you given when the contamination occurred in your community about your health? And did they give you any advice on what you should do um, from any of you? Who would like to start? Um, I'll, I'll take that one from, okay. from, from, from my community perspective. Um, I, three things have been mentioned up here that have not been gone into. One is silos. It was just touched on. We have been working in silos across Michigan. Jane Keon and I were one of several people on a committee fighting 
to break down the silos of the MDEQ because one hand over here is working on water, one is working on air, one is working on soil. None of them are talking. We have to change that culture. So when we asked the MDEQ to come in and look at the cumulative impact of what was happening to us from all these chemical companies, they didn't want to do it. We went to the Congress people in Washington, D.C. and talked to them. And it was as if they were so dismissive on cumulative impact. Nobody is looking at pollution, pollution on a cumulative impact nor collectively across Michigan. Another thing that is so hard for me to get grasp on is that in my community, we have high rates of cancer that are off the charts. We had to do a white cross campaign where we went to the people and we asked them to put a cross in their yard for everybody that had cancer, passed from cancer, or survived cancer. The news came out to cover it, and they were just astounded because one family, all eight, had cancer. My home, three of us had cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. My mother and father both died from lung cancer. On Miss Leonard's block, just a city block, 17 people. On my block alone, 12 people. That should tell you something is wrong. They sent the CDC in to do a study, and the CDC went back and said, no impact. So what does that tell you? It tells you your life is nothing to them. We are casualties of industry's greed, and we know it. Ms. Wilkins touched on it. All these racisms is impacting all of this. Racism itself social racism, economic racism, and environmental justice racism, all these is isms are helping us to be siloed. We have to break it down. We have to come around full circle and realize what is happening in Ascoda, it's happening in St. Louis, it's happening in Detroit, Michigan. We have a PFAS problem that they just connected right back to Marathon Oil Refinery, where PFAS just oozed out of the ground. Three companies were responsible in 218. In 219, it was traced back to Marathon. Nobody has come to us and told us, do not roll through it, do not touch it. So there is a challenge with that. They don't even want to acknowledge it. The other thing I wanted to touch, talk about was this, the doctors. Our doctors are not trained to identify environmentally related diseases. So when you say your doctor, didn't know about PPP or PFAS, they probably are telling the truth. So this collected data has to be exposed to the medical field, and we have to demand that our Department of Health and Human Services, which is using our tax dollars, use our tax dollars to help us determine health impacts from industry. So we are being told, oh, there's no impact. Then we find out two or three years down the line, we have to file a lawsuit because they lied and lied and lied. And as we watched No Defense last night, the DOD, I wish we could just all get together and come together collectively and sue them <laughs> about our health. Thank you, I Teresa. Ed, you were going to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sandy. Oh, well, I don't want to follow that. I mean, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> you give me some big shoes to follow here. Um, uh, you know, for us in Rockford, uh, when they came to my house and said 38,000 parts per trillion, um, I said, is this dangerous? And they said, eh, probably not. <laughs> but then I noticed two people got out and started bringing in bottled water. And so I thought, well, probably so then. Um, and we had to really fight to get people to acknowledge that there were some problems. They handed us the CDC sheet that anybody who's had any PFAS contamination has seen that gives you stuff from the C8 study that says very clearly, we don't really know, but you have nothing to worry about because it's two drops in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, which made me say, so you're saying two drops is okay, but three drops is dangerous? I'm not sleeping any better if that's your analogy here. 
it was the same thing with us with industry. Wolverine Worldwide had dumped tannery waste at the Christmas tree farm in giant troughs and dug and dug and dumped truckload after truckload after truckload. And when it overflowed, they punched through the clay underlining so it would go into the aquifer and then has contaminated a 25 square mile of my community. We had to fight to ask for blood testing. We only got blood testing when we got legal advice and got, went out on our own and got the blood testing that was awful. But we still struggle with doctors not knowing. Um, so you as the affected person have to become the expert then with your doctors. You have to say, if you don't know, let me educate you. And if you don't know, then we're going to start looking for these things on the C8 study just to make sure I'm okay. So I think we as impacted citizens are going to need to be the ones that help the medical community. We have to be the ones that work with researchers at Emory and at MSU and some of these others and ask you to be our advocates because they don't like to listen to us because we're not that smart. They assume. <laughs> but they will listen to other to other researchers. So I need them to be our allies. So I see, I see researchers going, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so here's what I could tell you. We can be loud and you can be smart and that's a dangerous combination. Yeah. I, I just wanna make one point on what they said when they tell you that, you know, three parts is not good and two parts is okay. That was the same scenario that they used with the PBB, where um, we could sell our milk as long as it was below uh, 0.3, but if it was 0.31, it was a toxic substance. So it didn't, it, it defies the logic of, mm -hmm. you know, and then your credibility in them goes right out the window. At least I, I didn't believe anything that they t said after that. So. Um, my thought is, is it in there or it isn't in there? That's the levels or measurements that they should take from here on out. I, I, oh, could I just yeah. say, uh, just the thought of Teresa's? Yes. Go I ahead. mean, or add, I, I think quickly. your concept about silos is so important for what we do because the silos make it hard to achieve anything. Uh, on the one hand, a basic silo we face is the environmental and public health division. So our site in St. Louis is primarily being worried about because of EPA. But there's this whole health consequences is of much more concern to the people than cleaning up this old site, even though the site is a problem. And, but in a bigger way, our siloing that does us in is siloing economically. I've become sort of an amateur economist, I guess, because of this struggle, even though I have a book on that. But in any case, um, we have one version of economics that talks about we need economic growth. You know, we need jobs. Most of our communities in Michigan, in one way or another, are struggling with economic problems. So we want jobs. But we have a, that type of economics that just anybody who comes in and creates a job is good, whether they're making DDT or whatever. And then we have the other type of economics, which is we can't afford the cost of these cleanups because they're so astronomically expensive. And those two can't be allowed. They should not be allowed to be separated. You know, we know, for example, in our case, we've done a detailed study of the company's finance that company never paid all its wages and all its taxes, never exceeded the half billion dollars we're now paying to clean up their mess. This is not economics, it's a lie. And worst of all, because we don't have enough money to clean it up, the other lie is we're making our kids and grandkids pay for cleaning this up because EPA, our federal government's running off a big deficit. We're not really paying even for the Superfund cleanup. It's, as Jane mentioned, we abolish the Superfund tax, so we're making our descendants pay for the profits, to talk about siloing again, we allowed the profits to go to the founders of places like Belsicle. The guy became one of the richest men in Chicago, all this stuff, you can look it up, but the, the kids and grandkids 
are paying economically because we don't have enough money to pay for these and their health consequences. Who knows what the cost of those. So we have totally siloed economics and we need to rebel against it. Thank you. I think Linda wanted to uh, make a comment. Maybe you can pass her the mic. I just wanted to quickly go back to the two versus three PPM. You're absolutely right. The more we learn about loads of contaminants, there's no such thing as the safe level. There's no such thing as the threshold, certainly when you're talking about a population. Uh, let me just add that, um, you know, like for the PBB disaster, um, when we, we talk about parts per billion, which is like one drop in a, in a swimming pool, not an Olympic swimming pool, but a regular swimming pool. But what's important to know is that your body's own hormones work at that concentration. This is not negligible. This is how your body's hormones work. Thank you. Uh, Danelle, you had something you wanted to add? I, I think that, um, I think it's important to, to even pinpoint, especially as we're going in this afternoon to talk about strategies, that there is precedent. And while we're in Michigan, we're focused on the crises here in Michigan. But this is uh, a national, and someone I, I mentioned earlier, and an international issue. But there is precedent for for making government and industry do the right thing. Uh, we've seen it through the environmental justice work all around this country in the Deep South, along Cancer Alley, the petrochemical industry, and the impacts uh, in, in other places. We've seen it when it comes to uh, some of the international work at the um, uh, climate change, the, the International uh, Conference of Parties, uh, and the research and stuff that's going forward and, and all of that. What I want to say is that in order for us to really make an impact here, we don't have to reinvent the wheel to do it, number one. Number two, we can learn those lessons from what folks have uh, you know, set out to, to do and, and some have achieved. And in and, and, and our thinking going forward, Let's not try to lift this up from like ground zero because we don't have to. There is precedent that we can learn from and then we can take it to the next level. But the fact that we're in this room together, the fact that we're hearing each other and, 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 and our hearts are open to this thing, we can do this in Michigan. And let's just do it, okay? That's let's right. just do it. I'd like to I'd like to draw from what you said in terms of not reinventing the wheel. I'd just like to add to that, that we put context to it. Because some of the things that have been established to work in large scale environments in one area may be good. However, there may be some contextual differences in those communities that need to be considered. And so, like in our community, we talk about what we were told to do. Uh, our, many of our physicians didn't know what to tell pregnant women how to handle this whole lead thing. Uh, so our, we work with our medical community and they said to ensure that everyone with all these different conditions, if you're a senior, if you're immune compromised, if you're a child zero to six, if you're pregnant and breastfeeding, drink only bottled water purified by reverse osmosis. Now that's good in the conversation when you're having it, but how do we get that information to people who are actually living the experience? So a, 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 a dual or multiple rollout needs to happen where there's continual conversation with community residents while these things are happening at a policy level, happen at a research level. What do people need to do every day to protect themselves and minimize the impact and understand the additional risk that they may be exposed to when they have these issues. And I would also like to encourage, how do we get past the exposure versus poison conversation? If, as, he, it, it was, as was said, it is what it is. If you've been exposed and it's a poison, you've been poisoned. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for sharing all of your awesome stories and for also inspiring all of us to keep going in this work. Another round of applause, please.
Thank you to this tremendous community panel. Um, I think, as you guys um, probably heard, any one of these individuals could have filled the whole day um, with their stories and the wisdom that they um, bring from their experience. And so we apologize for making you guys keep it so short. And we really um, uh, are looking forward to continuing the discussion as we move to the breakout groups this afternoon. So please hold some of these thoughts in your head as we continue to think about how do we move this work forward um, coming out of today. So thank you guys. Um, I especially want to thank Yvonne who stepped in this morning at very short notice to be part of this panel. So thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to introduce our last speaker for the morning. Um, and um, really delighted to have with us Dr. Courtney Kerrigan. Um, uh, who, she is an exposure scientist and an environmental epidemiologist whose research investigates contaminants in food, water, consumer, and personal care products um, in order to protect reproductive and children's health, which is the focus of her research. She's an assistant professor in the departments of food science and human nutrition and pharmacology and toxicology, which is a mouthful, um, at Michigan State University. And she's going to be talking with us today about some really exciting work that is coming out of the PFAS Northeastern Conference, working to build social networks among impacted communities across the, the country, beginning of social movement. So Courtney. Um, just give me a second, let's all breathe and prepare um, for an interlude before lunch. Um, hoping this will work, okay. Okay, so this morning I'm gonna do something a little bit new for me. Um, I usually come and talk about PFAS and health effects and um, all the great stuff that Dr. Birnbaum shared. So this morning I'm gonna um, share the story of how I came to help organize the National PFAS Conference at Northeastern and how its unique structure has helped to create badly needed movement on the issue of PFAS drinking water contamination. So I'm gonna go way back for just a minute. I first started in this field about 20 years ago, uh, working as an environmental consultant and risk assessor. And for about two years, I led a response action for a rural community with contamination in their private residential wells. So that should sound familiar to some of you. Um, their water contained a commonly used industrial solvent called trichloroethylene, or TCE. TCE is a carcinogen that affects both the kidney and the liver, uh, but at the time, it wasn't listed by IARC. Um, there was a class action lawsuit as well as a wrongful death lawsuit in that community. The wrongful death was for a mother who had passed away from kidney failure, leaving behind three young children. Her home had the highest levels in the community and she had lived there her whole life. I remember being really upset when I learned that it took 20 years from the time that the contamination was discovered um, in the water in that community to the time that they tested those wells, which were just downstream of the plume. And despite being diligent to stop the exposure once they finally did test uh, for those homes, nobody seemed to be able to tell them what it meant for their health. Um, and they had lots of questions, and they would ask me, and um, I thought, you know, you know, there's just must be a lack of science, right? Um, and I like science, and I wanted to help, so I enrolled in a doctoral program, and not long after I stopped working in that community, the woman who lived across the street from that mother was diagnosed with liver cancer and she had to have three quarters of her liver removed. And again, I was, I was really upset because at this point it was four years after the time that that contamination had been discovered and I thought, well, maybe if she had received medical monitoring back when they finally did test and they found it, they could have caught it sooner and improved her prognosis. So I entered my doctoral program with a resolve to help make sure that that kind of thing wouldn't continue to happen. Um, I was in the doctoral program um, studying environmental health at the Boston University School of Public Health, uh, specializing in exposure science and epidemiology in community settings. And I worked in the lab of Dr. Tom Webster. Um, and 
he studied PFAS. He actually was um, a scientist on the Sea Health study. Uh, and he also studied flame retardants. And so flame retardants are chemicals that are added to products to help reduce their flammability. Um, Sorry, I, I don't understand my notes here. Um, <laughs> I, I was at this at 2 in the morning, so that might be why. Um, <laughs> but I do know what flame retardants are because I've studied them for a decade. But um, they're added to products to help reduce um, their flammability. But at the time of their development, it wasn't really well understood that they can escape these products, enter our bodies, and that they're biologically active at low doses. Um, my dissertation research focused on characterizing human exposure to flame retardants in indoor environments, including for office workers and for pregnant mothers. Um, also during that time, I uh, discovered high exposures of flame retardants in gymnasts because um, they're used in the polyurethane foam of foam pits and the landing mats and so forth. Um, and more recently, I also published a study on exposures in spray foam workers. Um, but flame retardants are a class of, of chemicals that includes the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs, which are structurally similar to PBBs. And um, however, like PFAS is, PBDEs and other flame retardants have been used widely for decades in many pro products. Also like PFAS is, flame retardants escape these products, enter the air and dust of our indoor environments, and enter our bodies where they can remain for years. Unlike PFAS is, they do not migrate in water. And so uh, as far as we know right now, drinking water is not an important exposure pathway for people to uh, flame retardants. However, also like PFAS, is flame retardants are an example of regrettable substitution. So the PBDs were phased out beginning about in 2005, and they were replaced with other brominate organophosphate flame retardants. And you know there was a lot of impressive science going on. Uh, leading chemists like Heather Stapleton from Duke University, uh, was one of my collaborators and mentors, used non-targeted techniques to forensically identify replacements because the replacements were protected by trade secrets. So we couldn't know what they were. And then we had to do all this fancy science to try to figure out what it was. It took a while. Uh, there were also you know, very good toxicology, biomonitoring health studies. But of course, these were all coming after they were already starting to be used and people were already being exposed. Um, and so we would start, you know, we were having these findings and we're all talking about it. And um, concern is building and building. Uh, and it really turned into feeling like a scientific echo chamber because our science wasn't leading to the kind of action that we were really expecting it to. And so the real change finally began when um, Arlene Bloom kind of came onto the scene. So she's a chemist turned mountain climber who discovered and helped remove harmful flame retardants from children's pajamas back in the 1980s. Um, so you might have heard of tris 13 dichloro 2 propylphosphate um, So it's chlorinated tris. It was sort of the replacement to brominated tris. Um, and when they phased it out of children's pajamas, they just um, continue to use it in other products. And so when she found out about that, she was pretty mad and she applied her background in science and in leading expeditions to organize meetings and a movement to translate the science into action. And really it's thanks to both her and other scientific leaders like Heather, uh, who's shown here with her family, that many products, including those for our tiniest people, are now flame retardant free. And it's a good thing that we finally got movement because in the meantime, the science on health effects from replacements continue to grow. So for example, during my postdoc working with Russ Hauser at Harvard, I conducted a study along with Heather and John Meeker, uh, who's here at U of M, that identified adverse effects of replacement flame retardants on fertility. Our study also highlighted how replacements with shorter half-lives, like these uh, PFRs, aren't necessarily safer if they're biologically active at low doses and we are exposed continuously. So also during that time, I was doing a horrible commute to Boston from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is a beautiful place to live. Um, and one day I saw an article about Andrea Amico and the Seacoast Online. And for those of you who don't know Andrea, she is a mother of children who attended daycare at Pease Tradeport, which is in Portsmouth and is a former Air Force base where um, PFASs were detected in the drinking water from historic use of uh, AFFF, the aqueous film forming foams. And so I reached out to her, uh, we were practically neighbors, and started providing her with technical support. And I knew a lot about PFAS science because of my work at BU. Um, and I started digging into the literature and leveraging my network to share with her the knowns and unknowns about PFASs. And there are a lot of knowns about PFO and PFOS. 
they are clearly problematic. Uh, an 800-page review recently came out um, of the scientific literature. And um, I provided technical support indiscriminately to the community and also to our state. Uh, and what I noticed pretty quickly was that people in the position to do something wouldn't act. Um, but when I shared with Andrea, um, and she brought it to them, we started to see movement. And what I think we found pretty quickly is that working together, we really could achieve much more than we could achieve working independently. Um, and it also became really clear to me why community engagement was such an important focus of my training. Um, you know, they talked a lot about things that are very true, that um, working with communities helps improve your logistics and the quality of your science, um, its applicability and its translation to action. Um, what I didn't realize was that in some cases it's necessary to get anywhere in the first place. So I think that's an important thing to, to note here. Um, also a big emphasis um, in my training was the importance of listening to and believing communities which um, is really not unlike recent attention to the importance of believing women and survivors. So Andrea found it necessary to organize in order to be, more efficient, uh, to be a more efficient advocate, and she formed Testing for Peas and successfully advocated for 2,000 people to receive blood testing in her community. Um, so that blood testing actually came back with some important results. Um, it revealed that PFHXS is a marker for exposure to AFFF in drinking water. It was clearly elevated in the peas population compared to the general population. So the peas um, central tendency values, so like the average, is at the bottom, and NHANES in the blue, um, that's like our general population, and up at top are other PFAS impacted communities. Um, it also showed that PFHXS was elevated in the children, um, well, all, everyone, but this is just happens to be the children data, so about 40% were above the 95th percentile of the general population. And it also told this story, if you look at the concentrations by age, you can see that you see an increase from zero to two when the children would have been in, on peas in daycare, um, a decrease in those ages where they wouldn't be at daycare and they'd be in elementary schools off, off um, the trade port, and then once um, the population hit working age, you can see those levels increase again. Um, and so, you know, a requirement for being in the study was that you had to ever have drank the water. And so, those children that are sampled, where you see those levels decreasing, that um, is really reflecting the time away from drinking that water. So you can see a marker of the drink, you know, the effect of drinking that water, and you can also see um, but down at the bottom is PFNA, which is not, um, I think, a big part of of their exposure, uh, you don't see that big increase, then drop, and then increase again. Uh, around this time, the EPA the health advisory came out. And it wasn't not regulatory enforceable, but it, it really was an important piece of movement. Uh, we hadn't seen any movement on the PFAS front in quite a long time. And so a lot of us were just happy to see anything. Um, Bob Delaney had brought to, uh, on one of our science policy PFAS calls, the need to help his administration better understand the issue. And so uh, we put together a study that was led by Elsie Sunderland's group at Harvard that leveraged EPA's UCMR3 data to quantify the number of people impacted by drinking water above the health advisory. Um, and Dr. Brimbrow mentioned that the six million was an underestimate, so um, this really is showing people with um, levels above around the 70 parts per trillion. And there's better data. Um, and it's since been estimated that water of over 110 million Americans contains any PFAS. Another thing that we did was um, organize the National Conference of, this, of the Social and Scientific Discovery of PFAS. So this is the first national PFAS conference at Northeastern. Um, I was just invited along for the ride. It was the brainchild of Phil Brown. And when I credited him with this, he actually said that, you know, he got the idea from Arlene Bloom, which is why I thought to mention her. Um, and I didn't get it at first, being a scientist and being just <laughs> having gone to so many scientific meetings, I just kept going, well, you know, we need more scientists to talk and we need to like really hammer them with the science. And uh, it wasn't until um, we had the first conference and I, under I saw how it went and I learned so much that I really understood the power and the importance of 
uh, bringing together these different uh, groups. So we brought together community leaders. We used most of the grant money that we got uh, to put together the conference to, to fund community leaders to come. We uh, brought together government scientists, environmental health scientists, lawyers, legislators, press, social scientists, all people who work on PFAS, uh, but normally aren't in the same room together and don't hear each other's stories. And I've got to say, that first conference I learned more and I found it to be uh, more engaging than any other conference I've been to. Um, maybe that's not saying much because I mostly go to scientific conferences, but um, it was really impactful to me and I, I think I had not anticipated that. Um, the second time we held it, which was just last year, we integrated. So the first time we had like community panels where just community members came out. The second time we did it, we integrated our community members and our different kind of sectors all into um, sessions together so that they would kind of work together. And um, that also worked really well. We had a huge turnout. We actually had to put people in kind of like other rooms to view remotely, uh, but could still be on site. So this is a picture of the group that attended that. Um, some things that have come out of the national conference, the organization of the um, PFAS Contamination Coalition. Um, since the first conference, um, the ATSDR is now doing a big biomonitoring and health study for um, DOD sites and others that have PFAS contamination in their, in their drinking water. Um, I'm on the advisory board for the PEAS cap, um, along with Andrea. And um, I have a project now um, along with uh, my collaborators at Northeastern and Silent Spring Institution looking at effects of PFASs on children's immune systems. So we, we know that they do affect the immune system. Um, we don't know exactly how they affect uh, immune systems of children exposed through contaminated water, um, particularly with the AFFF mixture. So people have called the AFFF mixture like a wishes brew of PFAS because it contains so many different PFASs and lots of them haven't been studied. Um, so sort of that, that mixture is part of, is part of our question. Uh, we have developed the PFAS Exchange, which is an online resource center. I actually have a poster on this. I've got like five posters in the next room, four are mine, one is Phil's. Um, so come check them out. Um, PFASExchange.org is the website and it has some useful resources, including um, um, a data interpretation tool is, up in, is coming. Um, uh, there's, yeah, sorry, I just want to plug it just for a second. There's also a um, connecting communities component, so it lists different community organizations to help you connect with other communities, and uh, we'll get back to that later, but, um, okay. See, this is, this is where I fell asleep. Um, so, uh, I, I mentioned 110 million Americans with, with impacted water. This is a, a map from EWG and um, the North Northeastern group that's um, just trying to visualize the contamination that's been found. I mean, we've seen a huge explosion in discovery of contaminated sites over the past five years. Uh, you'll see the concentration in Michigan. Um, in part, that's because Michigan is looking, uh, has one of the most um, intensive um, monitoring programs of, of any state in, in the US. Um, they've monitored over 2,000 public water systems that serve 80% of state residents, including community water supplies, schools, and child care providers on their own wells and tribal water systems. Um, they detected PFAS in about 10% of the system, so 170 with elevated levels at about 51 of those, um, so about 3% were between 10 and 70 parts per trillion. And only one or two were above the 70 parts per trillion. One of them was parchment. So I'm just going to highlight some. So parchment is um, kind of down in the bottom left. Uh, one of the communities down by Kalamazoo, and um, it's from historic use of PFAS in a paper, a paper mill. Um, we know that PFASs have been used in tannery operations, um, obviously in, in airports uh, that use the AFFF, um, and in plating operations, so just to name a few um, sources in the state. Um, I've been I think since I've gotten to Michigan, I've been focusing uh, most of my efforts on three PFAS impacted communities in Oscoda, Northern Kent, and Parchment. Um, communities that have you know, contamination discovered have drinking water interventions, um, varies you know, depending on the source. It's pretty much always expensive. They have do not eat advisories, being told not to eat the fish, not to eat um, homegrown or produced foods, um, not to eat or touch the foam. Uh, I actually have a poster on that um, 
which I'm uh, in collaboration with Jennifer Fields' group at Oregon State. Um, recently started a project uh, called PFAS United, which is a national investigation of transport and exposure from drinking water and diet. So this is a collaboration between um, myself, uh, Chris Higgins at Colorado School of Mines, John Adgate at um, Colorado School of Public Health, um, Detlef Knappy and Owen and um, Jane at NC State, and also Heather Stapleton at Duke. Um, and so we are sampling foods from PFAS impacted areas across the country and estimating exposure from both drinking water and diet in order to better understand this issue and inform future recommendations. Um, so we're actually kicking off our sampling, um, our field effort, um, I'm not sure what to call it, and to come up with a good name, but we are enrolling participants from Parchment um, starting this spring. So we'll have a kickoff event hopefully in April. Um, I'm also, I've also started organizing um, an event at the Fate of the Earth Symposium um, at MSU. So uh, this year it's um, a kind of a dual um, session followed by an afternoon workshop focused on PFAS and it's just an opportunity to get together um, and organize ourselves to understand how we can better address the PFAS contamination in Michigan. Uh, MSU just launched a PFAS uh, center, so um, we'll have researchers from the center there as well, and you're all invited. Um, and I think I'm about out of time, so thank you so much. Um, take any questions. question was about the precautionary principle and um, whether there's any conversation in our government or our universities about um, any companies to prove that something's safe before it goes on the market. And I'm sorry that I'm not a policy person. I always get these questions and I always feel um, like I'm not the best person to answer them, but I will try. I believe that TSCA, and I'm looking at Linda, TSCA reform was supposed to creep towards that. <laughs> So the EU is implementing something more like that, um, and we're all watching. Yeah, do you want to take it? Yeah, I'll, 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 Thank you. I'll, I'll You're retired. You take it. No, I'm really not a policy person either. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that in our country, precautionary principle is totally interpreted backwards. In our country, people want to say precautionary principle would mean you act when you don't have any information. That's not what the precautionary principle says. The precautionary principle says you act in the presence of concerning information, but without certainty. And science is never certain. So it's a problem here. And, and Tosca, um, Frank Lautenberg is probably turning over in his grave. Okay, we are going to break for lunch. Hooray. Um, during the lunch, we're having what we're calling a strolling lunch, which means that we have food set up in the room across the way here, and it's also where the posters are set up. So please go over there, look at the posters, catch people that have spoken during the morning that you want to have a follow-up conversation with. In particular, I understand that Dr. Birnbaum is unusually going to be leaving Michigan early in order to beat the weather in North Carolina. <laughs> so she's going to be leaving shortly um, after lunch. So if you want to have a conversation with her, now is your opportunity. Two quick things before folks head out. 
I mentioned earlier, and I'm just going to reiterate, that this afternoon we're going to move into breakout groups to work on specific issues related to action moving forward. We've pre-identified a set of five of those. They are in your program. There is newsprint um, by the registration table for those of you who have, as you've listened this morning, have additional ideas about things you would like to talk to people about. Please get those up there during the break if you have an idea about that, because we will be moving into the breakout groups um, after lunch, after we hear from Monica Lewis-Patrick, who, Monica, are you here? Um, also known as the Water Warrior, um, she is not to be missed. Um, please make sure that you get back from lunch in order to, in time to hear her. We will reconvene at 1.05. We're going to make up a little bit of lost time by shortening the lunch break. My apologies um, to you for doing that, but we also want to make sure people get out of here on time. Okay, have a great break.
Hopefully, yes. So.
someone else they said last well. thing and it was up on top. Yeah. So, oops. I didn't mean to open it. I was going to put no, it on yeah, the desktop. Either one. Then at least. Oops. Oh, because is it going to. Want me to I'll do this, and you can have your flashlight right back, cool. and then you don't have to worry about Great. forgetting it or yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm probably it's open. The PowerPoint is on files open. Let me just close all these. Here too, oh. so perfect. There you go. You're welcome. I
you want me to stand here and do it? Oh, no, no, I have a thing. Okay. I have one of these, but I okay. don't think you have an available so, slot, so. Okay, so I don't really know how this thing works. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to touch it. I know, let me ask these guys, because it's their slide. Okay. Let me see if I can do something here without destroying everything. Uh, I want to make this little, make this little. Okay, now, can you see, is yours one of these? Yes. I think it's one of the, let me see. Let me just pull up the name and see if it'll look. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Now, which one was theirs? Hmm. I think it's this Mapping. one. Mapping. The yes, Mapping. Okay. Thank you. All right, no, my pleasure. Without, I, yeah. So you made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> you <Thanks. laughs> There it is. Okay. Thank you. Let me see. I have a
it's not mic'd out there? No. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to get started. If folks could find your seats. Um, Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we realized it was a short lunch break um, and really appreciate all the speed eating that went on. ready? Do you want me to advance your slides or are you going to come up here to do it? Do you want me? Okay. Move. Keep. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, welcome back from lunch. Um, and the very short break that we, um, that we had <laughs> today, sorry about that. Um, we're going to keep moving um, in part because one of our next speakers has to leave immediately after she's scheduled to fly off to Howard University for another water conference. So we're really delighted that she's squeezed us in um, to her schedule and we want to respect that and, and keep, keep ourselves on schedule um, today. So I'm really, really delighted to introduce our next um, speaker, um, Monica Lewis Patrick, also known as the Water Warrior. Some of you have, may have heard about her. She is co-founder and current president of We the People of Detroit, a community coalition that has been working for a number of years now to conduct community-driven research on issues that are identified by the community um, in need of additional research evidence. Um, and the organization works to inform and empower 
the public on critical issues related to civil rights, land, water, um, and also the democratic process. Um, we are um, so delighted to have her here today. She's gonna be co-presenting with one of her colleagues, um, Nadia Gaber, a medical anthropologist who is also in training to become a allopathic doctor, yes. So Monica calls her doctor, doctor. Um, <laughs> Um, and she is a member of the we, um, the we the People of Detroit Community Research Collective. Um, we're, I think we're in, you guys are all in for a real treat um, as they talk. They're going to be talking about mapping the water crisis. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Amy. And could we just give a round of applause to Amy and an amazing job that's been done. I can tell you last night uh, I left and I was, uh, it was really heartbreaking uh, to just hear what's happening in Oscoda. And is Tony in the room? About four years ago I had never heard of PFOS, never heard the phrase, uh, the terminology. And Tony and I were in a room at the All About Water Conference. And I was there mad as hell because they were shutting off water in Detroit. And Tony was telling me about what was happening to Oscoda, so then I got mad about Oscoda. So as we sit in that room for about a day and a half of conferences and workshops and lectures, there's a kinship that happened. And so I told Tony as we were leaving the conference, I said, I won't ever work on water and have an opportunity where I can't bring you to the table. I'll make sure every time that I can raise your name, I'll lift it. And one of the things that I can say about Tony Espinola, Espinola is that every time he's had that opportunity, he's done the same thing for me. So one of the things I want to help you sort of come into the space with, and I've heard the theme throughout the day, especially from the last panel, is that community is the expert. Community is the expert. That's my friend. I know him as Tony the Tiger, so I, I you know. <laughs> but one of the things that we found out uh, very quickly is that people ignore community. They treat us as though you're a casualty of a war. And one of the things that we found out in Detroit, because our organization is young, I'm old, but the organization's young. The organization is 10 years old, it's only been a nonprofit for about five years, but the work that we've done has been monumental. But in 2014, when an amazing activist by the name of Charity Hicks began to tell us that we were going to experience the shutting off of water to the magnitude that had never been seen in American history. And we thought, okay, charity's brilliant. Maybe it's just one of those moments where we just don't get it. But then as days and months and weeks went on, what we found is that charity had set off an alarm and that what we were in the middle of was a water war. So what we saw happen is as there had been a master narrative all across Michigan, that shutting off water was because black folks didn't pay their bills. Irresponsible leadership, not knowing how to lead yourself, not prepared to govern. Some of the same things I heard this morning. But the other thing that we knew is that people were getting sicker and sicker. What we also knew is that people were losing their children. And so when we got a call saying that Charity Hicks had been arrested for just trying to let her neighbors know that they had been shut off from water. Then I've got a grandmother that's Southern, and you may not know this phrase from the North. She told me, she said, things like that stick in my crawl. Well, that's what it did for me. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. Just the thought that one of her neighbors had just had a baby that was premature, and that woman was in threat of losing that premature baby because she didn't have running water in her house. That became personal. So as we begin to look at what was happening around water shutoffs, one was how do we answer the question that every human life should have a pathway to clean, safe, and affordable water? Because somebody had decided that poor folks and black folks didn't deserve that same right. How do we evidence to people the imbalance and the inequity and the injustice of denying people access to clean, safe, affordable water? Well, what I know is that sometimes when they won't believe the activists, they might believe the academics. So there were people like Dr. Nadia Gaber 
And Professor Emily Kudel, who is an architect and a designer, she's right now doing a fellowship at the University of Buffalo. They came into the community just to help us deliver water because we were told at that time we would only need to deliver water for about three weeks. That there's no way that our government would not respond to our crisis. Well, that three weeks has now turned into six years. We deliver about 150 to 200 tons of water a year. We not only deliver water in Detroit, but we deliver water in Flint. Because see, before Flint became a buzzword for many of you, we were working in Flint two years before most people would even admit that this crisis had occurred. We have been delivering water in Flint now for three years. And we're still delivering water because of failed leadership by government, by mental health and public health workers, by persons that were supposed to ensure that what's coming out of your tap is clean and safe, they failed. And so even to this day, people are purchasing bottled water in place of water running out of their tap because they don't trust it. But at the same time, we are supporting the commodification of bottled water, which is lending itself to the privatization of water. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. So I'm just a country girl. This is not my vocation. I didn't choose water, water chose me. And so what I know, because my name is Monica Lewis Patrick, Lewis means warrior, when I find a good fight, I get in it. <laughs> so we started something called the We the People of Detroit Community Research Collective. And two things happened. One, we had found out in Michigan under emergency management that if we partnered with a university, that Governor Snyder could use his powers to actually commandeer our data. So we built a table of researchers, and now we have 67 researchers from all across the country that convene with We the People of Detroit on specific issues that need to be answered with an academic and scientific lens. And so this is why the table has been created. But guess who runs the table? Not academics the community, the people. And one of the things I want to say as we're moving to the next slide is that when we were in the middle and continue to be in the middle of this health crisis, we could not get one health director or school of public health to respond to the fact that it is an egregious act to deny people access to water and that there is a public health impact when people don't have access to water. But didn't you think it was interesting that not one university, not one academic in the state of Michigan would speak up for Detroit? And so students, your students here at the University of Michigan decided that it was egregious. And so they began to go to their professors as they were coming and volunteering, delivering water with us, and said, I don't know if I want to go to a school that has the only school of public health in the state of Michigan but will not speak to water shutoffs. It also has been on these grounds that your students, over 3,000 of them, organize themselves to talk about health impacts connected to fossil fuels, connected to water shutoffs. So even sometimes when we as adults have not gotten it, our babies have gotten it. And so thank God for the students of the University of Michigan, because they stood when the, when the academic and the universities did not. So one of the things I want to tell you just off the rip, and I know we're at U of M, but I'm going to give some credit to Michigan State. Dr. Elizabeth Mack said, yeah, go green. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mack said that you know, we're right now sitting in about 11.9% of the American population cannot afford their water. This research was done about three years ago. We are on pace in the next two years where about 35.6% of the nation will not be able to afford their water. So this is not just black folks and people in Detroit, but this is people all across the country. The next one, please. After that one, please. The other thing I need you to know is that this is not divided along uh, uh, political lines. What we have found all across this country, if you look at places like Chicago, Chicago's water rates have tripled in the last eight years. Toledo's water rates have doubled in the last few months. What you're finding in Detroit is water rates have gone up over 120% in the last 12 years. So for communities that you have seen the population dwindle, for communities where you have seen the tax base dwindle, this is not the people's fault, but it better be the people's fight. And so what we came together, and this is Dr. D uh, Gloria House. Uh, she actually is retired from this institution. 
And one of the things that she told us, she said, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's coming to save us. And she encouraged us along with the Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson as black women. She said, we're the mothers of all civilization. And we have to love all of our children enough to tell the truth. She said, so what I'm going to tell all of y'all to do is all of you have been to the institutions and the academy. You all have advanced degrees, which we all do in some area. She said, so convene yourselves. And so this is how the collective started. And so the first question that the community had is, are water shutoffs really happening? Now, mind you, this research is only a, a small segment of the research because we had to sue the city of Detroit eight times to get even this information. Now, this is data that used to be readily available and mailed to your houses. Now, wonder what has changed. We're more computerized, more digitized, but you can't give me the same information that you used to mail to my home about how many people have been shut off from water? And so if you look at this map, if you know anything about Detroit, you'll know that the lower half is riverfront property, is downtown. The middle is actually two other small cities, Highland Park and Hamtramck. But the rest of it is the city of Detroit. Now, they would lead you to believe that it's just poor folks. But guess what? East English Village is one of the most affluent communities. 30% of that population within that particular neighborhood cannot sustain their water access. So does it sound like poor people not wanting to pay their bills, or does it sound like that there is a systemic issue that is causing people to not be able to afford their bills? The next one, please. The other thing that we wanted to remind people as we were under this contrived bankruptcy that was actually deconstructing our water department, we wanted to remind Michiganders who built it, who paid for it. And so what you're seeing here is that you're seeing the massiveness of that water system. One of the things I'll say, and I'll just tell you the truth, Flint got poison in their haste to steal Detroit's water system. That's how Flint got poison. They were in a rush to be able to push through the bankruptcy, the regionalization of a water system, and they didn't want to pay fair market value for it. So this is how you got here. So now what you have is in the deep turquoise, that's the city of Detroit. But this system runs all the way up to the top of the T, which is Flint. We provide water to 126 municipalities and townships. 40% of the state of Michigan gets their water from a well that the residents of Detroit built. But in 1955, the, the water department director at that time said that if we are forced to build this system out to the suburbs, that the city of Detroit will go bankrupt. But we were legislated to do so because we were the only city with the bonding capacity to actually build the infrastructure. We had no idea that we were actually cutting off our nose to spite our face, that we were headed down a pathway where the actual rate payers were going to be paying uh, wholesale and the owners would be paying retail. So we put together this and it was critical for us to be able to demonstrate and visualize as much as we could because there has been a very uh, divisive kind of approach to how people talk about Detroit versus everybody else, Detroit and the rest of the state. And so one of the things we wanted to demonstrate is just the discrepancies in terms of the wholesale rates versus retail. That deep turquoise blue is what Detroit sells the water to the municipalities at that level. Where you see the black marking is the markups. Those municipalities and townships are marking their water up anywhere from 100 to 1,000 percent. But guess what the narrative is? Well, we're paying for Detroit's bankruptcy. We're paying for failed leadership. And guess what that does? This is some of the conversation that Tony and I had. If we don't put the facts on the table, and if we don't have a conversation where we're bringing people together, then it becomes very easy for other people on the other side of the state to just decide to wash their hands of us and to continue to support policies that are bad for us. But if we get in rooms like this and begin to deputize ourselves to understand that it's only as Michiganders operating in concert and consensus that we're going to be able to build a better Michigan where water is accessible to all. Can you go to the next one just on housing? Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump off and uh, hand the mic to, to Nadia because I want her to be able to, uh, to share with you some of the health study work we've done. But I just think it's important that you see these two uh, slides here. 
One, we had our young people, and one of the things they wanted to demonstrate is not only what had happened in terms of the height of the water shutoffs in the city of Detroit, but they wanted to show the parallels between what was happening in Flint at the same time, but then what I thought was so magical, because sometimes we get so stuck in the trauma and the fight, that the young people were able to see where we were winning, where our work and coordination of work was making impact. And so where you see them begin to step back as we stood up was in moments where the city council and Kevin Orr came. Well, community showed up and resisted that. So what did they do? They began to soften. They began to put a moratorium on shutting off water. Of course, as Kevin Orr got closer to the bankruptcy, he ramped up shutting off water again. But then what happened is that the organizations and the community got together and then they brought in uh, they brought in activists from across the country. They brought in the National Nurses Union. Netroots got involved. And so what you saw is the momentum begin to shift around the conversation. So the conversation didn't stay at, oh, poor black folks don't want to pay their bills. Then as more and more evidence came to the forefront, they had to shift. So then the conversation began around, okay, we can't give you affordability, but we'll give you assistance. Well, what we know is assistance is charity. It says, if I want to help you, I will. And if I have a few dollars, I'll give it to you. But what affordability says is I will create a sustained pathway to ensure that you have access to water. That's totally different. And then this is the last one that I'll end with before we go to uh, Dr. G Gaber, is that this is the one that brings tears to my eyes. Because when you think about the fact that one of the things that we were sold uh, during the great heightened level of the auto industry was that you could get a chicken in every pot, that as long as you worked hard, you'd be able to send your children to college, you'd be able to meet your mortgage and pay for your house and your health care. Well, my grandparents moved to Detroit in 1952. My, grandfa my great grandfather is the father of Willie Horton, the baseball player. And one of the things we took a lot of pride in coming to Detroit in those summers, 13 grandkids packed into a Chevy station wagon, was that coming to Detroit was really where our family was able to get a leg up. They were able to work in the auto industry coming out of the coal mines of Virginia. And so my grandfather in 52, with having 18 children, never thought he would own a home. So for him, later on in 67, to buy a home was like he had hit the lottery. To then turn around and see that in 2014, you saw over 15,000 homeowners forced into foreclosure just on water debt. They didn't owe property taxes, but they couldn't afford their water because they were on a fixed income. And so when I look at this and you look at it and you compare it to the first map that we showed you about water shutoffs, do you see correlation? Do you see correlation? You visually see correlation. And so one of the things that I want to just remind you is that it's not just about one thing. It's about everything. That this has been essential in terms of displacing black families, that it has been critical in terms of shutting down schools, it has been a component of putting a division in our community where there are two Detroits, there's downtown and midtown, and then there's the rest of everybody that's around town. And so this is some of the folks that came together. Nadia uh, actually led a team of researchers. Over 40 researchers came together to do the mapping, the water crisis book, to put digital evidence to what we already knew was happening. Well, that is an impossible act to follow, but I do want to thank Monica for inviting me and passing the mic along. Um, it's really just been part of the practice and part of what I've learned through doing this type of work um, is how important it is um, to build these partnerships um, in a community research collective that have also really um, um, just strengthened each of us in bringing our collective talents to the table. So what are... Um, group has been doing is bringing together, as I said, activists, academics, researchers, designers, to try to draw on the expertise that we learn when we um, 
or in school or in the academy or in, in institutions like this. And I was a graduate student when we did this work. Um, but also to make sure that we draw on the expertise of people with lived experience um, who are really the best able to pose questions that we should be investigating um, and for whom the data is created with in this model and um, belongs to. So that was always really important in us designing and setting up these studies. And we realized, um, you know, I didn't personally come to do public health research, I'm an anthropologist, um, but in writing about the cultural, social, and political changes that have created these conditions, it is really hard to not have any preliminary data, to not be able to have a baseline picture of what's going on. And when I got here, it became really clear nobody was doing that research. Nobody was following up. And we realized very quickly, if we didn't organize to do something and figure out what tools were at hand, train ourselves, go out there and do the work, it wasn't going to happen. So this is one study that we did in partnership um, with Henry Ford Health System, some investigators there, um, who were able to get um, internal data from their hospital records and look at folks who had come in because they had been diagnosed with a water-related illness. Um, and we were able to take that data, which Monica mentioned, was gotten through years of lawsuits and FOIA requests um, from the city of Detroit, and map out, um, this is a, on the right, what we showed you earlier, where those shutoffs were happening control for what's called the social vulnerability index, where we talk about poverty, access to housing, healthcare, and transportation, um, and, and then see if there's a specific correlation between the geographic areas where shutoffs were happening and the incidence of health-related, water-related health issues um, that were seen at Healthy For Henry Ford. And they did find that people who had been diagnosed with these skin and soft tissue diseases that were water related were one and a half times more likely to live on a block in a neighborhood that was shut off. And it, that same effect went the other direction. So that living on a block with water shutoffs increases your likelihood of getting diagnosed with one of these illnesses. And why that's important is it also means it doesn't matter if you yourself lose water. I mean, it does matter, but it's not only the people who are shut off, it's the people around you. These diseases we know from the founding of public health itself spread, they're communicable. Um, and we were able to show that these um, have more impacts among those who are the most socially vulnerable. This is another study that we didn't do, but I just wanted to put out there because of that work with Henry Ford, um, someone who was formerly with um, the Michigan Community Health um, looked through their records and found double, in one case triple, these rates of Campylobacter, Shigellosis, Giardia, diseases that are not very prevalent um, in the United States, commonly thought of as traveler's illnesses, um, happening with their epicenter in Detroit at this time. So Monica mentioned what we did was we looked to the toolkits that we had at hand. What could we do ourselves? And we found this... Um, toolkit that the CDC puts out, it's called the CASPER, and it's designed to be used after disasters to do rapid and reliable public health needs assessment. Um, and it kind of lays out a sampling method that you know can be both random and representative of a city. Um, and it's this two-stage cluster sampling method, so where you kind of use census data to pick out, we had 30 different clusters all over the city of Detroit. Then. Um, the second phase, we engaged all of our community members at this um, training to um, make sure that we were sampling every um, nth house, depending on the number. So we were kind of teaching different survey practices and methods. We were doing it together, and then we were going out in teams um, to talk to folks. And you know, with our survey, um, this was, again, a citywide assessment, because we knew that um, the first thing that people might say is, well, you just picked the few people that you knew and you talked to them. So we wanted to make sure we had representative data. And at the time of contact, so this is any given day someone knocks on your door, 5% of people whose doors we knocked on um, were without water when we, um, when we met them. And we were able to connect all of them to the water rights hotline, which is another part of the practice of doing community-based, community-led research, which I'll come back to. 17% of households were at that time or had been shut off from water. More than a quarter were at risk of being shut off. They had active notices that they were at risk of shut off. And the average length of time that the people 
stayed in their homes without water was 10 and a half days. This, I think, was really important because at the time the city was saying it's an average of 24 hours and people get their service reconnected. That was clearly not true. Um, and this doesn't even count um, all the people who moved or they went and stayed at their sister's house or you know they got out of town for a while, they stayed in a hotel. So these are people who are just living in their house and making do with bottled water. I'm getting the note to wrap up, so I'm going to move along quickly. Um, Authority Health put out this recommendation that the following groups of people should be protected based on their health vulnerability from being shut off. So when we went, we said, well, how many houses did have infants and children under 18? More than 50%. How many people had um, elders in the home, people with disabilities, people in, with critical medical needs? Um, so 82% of the households that we surveyed would have been protected under the moratorium that Authority Health proposed to the city of Detroit had it been respected. We did a second survey, I'll just say really quickly, where we dug down deep and then we wanted to say, okay, how can we look at the psychosocial impacts of not having water? So we um, did a two-part study. Again, I think the method is important. So we drew on the experience that we, the people, had delivering water for years, working with community members to create a survey that talked about how do your practices actually change? What do you do when you feel like you're at risk of shutoff? Um, and then used this um, standard um, psychosocial distress scale from Harvard, and we were able to create something that was ethnographically grounded in local experience, but then also had a metric where we could compare it to a valid instrument of measuring mental distress. And we found a statistically significant and a substantial relationship. Um, that's that table on the right. And we also found significant changes in the safety-related behaviors and the water stress of people who both have had their water shut off and people who just fear that they're at risk and have a lot of financial stress. So, you know, we continue to call for an immediate moratorium on all water shutoffs and like Monica mentioned, an affordability plan that's um, based on household income and doesn't rely on um, assistance programs. And we also, um, you know, whenever we do this, we report this data back to community first because we respect that it was built with them and belongs to them. And we also want to give people information about what can we do to protect ourselves and also if your water is off, how you can call the water rights hotline and get immediate emergency assistance. So I'm going to hand it back to Monica, I think, for question and answer. And after the water shutoffs, we saw that a lot of people could not afford their water bills because the water company, through city council, was consenting to adding extra penalties and fees and drainage fees and non-pervious uses on families that were already stressed. And uh, it seems like the people that are already stressed were also put under more pressure, as you said, with the home foreclosures uh, due to the tax bills. Um, has the city been open to talk, or the water, uh, Great Lakes Water Authority been open to talk to you guys about relieving some of that, that stress with these added uh, penalties and fees and, and taxations, as far as I call them, uh, drainage fees? Because if it's a tax, it has to go through and be approved through legislation with our city council. I think what has happened is that uh, that they have been exposed for the, uh, for the misleading information that they've provided to the public. And I think in that exposure, what has happened is research like what we just demonstrated, where we have traveled all around the country and around the globe, actually helping people connect the dots, it's really exposed them. And so I think what you have now is because there's no way that you can run uh, from the data. You cannot run from the research. And so uh, my organization, We the People of Detroit, has spent thousands of dollars sending me places that will cost thousands of dollars to be able to shed a light. Because Mr. Brown and the Water Department, DWSD and GLEWA, has spent a lot of money PRing this issue. And the money they spent creating PR, they really could have turned the water on. 
What we know in Detroit, it takes a million dollars to help a thousand families. So if you have tens of thousands of families shut off from water, then you tell me how far is 2.5 million going to go? And now Mr. Brown, of course, is touting that he is out there fighting for more money. Well, what we know is before you took over the water department, there was an allocation of $5 million to help families that couldn't afford water. So whoever negotiated the Great Lakes water deal didn't have Detroiters in mind. And the thing I'm going to say to all of these folks in this room about water, too, is that when we know that we need almost $6 trillion to address our water infrastructure, and Congress has only allocated $1.74 then that should tell everybody in this room they've already started deciding who's going to drink and who will not. We better decide in this room that everybody has a right to water, and then we can figure out the path to get them there. So um, my question is, is related to what Teresa was saying. So a couple of years back, the city started charging folks for this, dra this drainage fee. So it's not just the water. Now you're paying for the rain. Literally, depending on how much impermeable surface you have, your roof, sidewalk, driveway, whatever. And recently, I've seen that pe even people who have their water shut off have been getting a bill for drainage. So what, if they don't pay that, I don't, I mean, their water's already shut off. What's going to happen to the people who, who are getting this bill for drainage? Well, the drainage bill is going to drive poor people deeper into debt. Uh, because what it is is now they have changed the process to where the bills were attached to the property. The bills are now attached to the person. So now what they do is they make you, as you're entering to a payment plan or you're trying to get a bill in your name, you must provide your Social Security number so that that bill will follow you everywhere you go. So you've had people come into the city actually trying to buy homes from the land bank where there has been a $20,000, $40,000 uh, bill attached to that property. And so those persons thinking that they're buying into the American dream, getting a home for $1,000 or two or three, then find out after they purchase it that they now have been indebted to twenty and thirty and forty thousand dollars of unpaid water bills. So what this is doing is it's actually uh, my mother told me something in uh, 2014. She's a retired master sergeant from the U.S. Army. Uh, she's a retired nurse from the VA, and she told me she's a combat veteran. She's still at 75 years old, can be called up by her government because she has a unique skill of setting up a surgical unit in a war zone. And she told me in 2014, this is a no-nonsense lady, like I cut up, she doesn't. She said that, <laughs> she said that shutting, off war, uh, shutting off water is an act of war. And then she quoted the Geneva Convention. And she told me then, she said, you can't shut off your enemy in times of war. So you decide now. And she, t she was talking to me really straight. She said, you're my daughter, so I want you to know you got to either die on your feet or on your knees. She said, but you have entered into a war, and they will kill you about this water. And so I, I live my life understanding that I am risking everything because I don't want to believe that there will come a time when my children's children's children won't be able to drink. So those are the things that get me up at night, that wake me up in the morning. Yesterday morning, we had a family of 16 living in a flat with no water and sanitation. We have data at the national level that says that southeastern Michigan sits in the largest hepatitis A outbreak in American history. But at the same time, you had the state government of Michigan telling us that it was intravenous drug use and same-sex partners. When we know that the science says that the biggest driver of hepatitis A is the inability to wash your hands and have proper sanitation. And so I tell my grandchildren all the time, my daughter tells me, she said, Mama, you've traumatized the babies about this water. <laughs> but I tell them all the time, if you don't remember anything else about your grandmother, I want you to know that I deputize myself to dedicate my life, not just for black babies and brown babies, but for every human being on the planet to have access to water. Because what we found out very quickly in Detroit is that it was very easy for people to dismiss us as black and brown and poor folks. But then when we united our fight and our struggle with families, the Navajo Nation, you've got women that have been trucking in water for over a decade. When we connected that struggle to families in Puerto Rico, 
that have been dealing with the fallout of our war games in their backyard for decades. When we connected it to what was happening in, in Zimbabwe and all around the globe, in Ireland where they're metering their water and the people are rising up, is what we know is water is the one thing that will unite us. Everything else is dividing us. But if we can't figure out, none of you can make it without this life-sustaining source. And my grandmother used to tell us when we would fight as kids, she said, get in the room. And I don't care what you do, but you can't come out till you work it out. So I'm hoping today was one of those get in the rooms. And I'm hoping Amy doesn't let you out till you work it out. I'm going to take that as a call to move, as a call to movement. Um, we knew what we were doing when we put Monica in this place in the lineup. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Nadia, for coming with us. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. We are getting ready to move to the next uh, portion of the day. And um, this is um, moving us to the breakout groups where we are going to get to have a conversation amongst ourselves about topics that we're passionate about. We've identified f uh, five topics up front that we are hoping there will be interest in having some conversation about. They're in your programs. You're about to hear from um, representatives in the room about what topics are going to be talked about within those. We also gave folks the opportunity over the course of the day to identify additional topics. We've got a couple that have been identified. Um, and so what we are going to do now is we're going to hear five, what we're calling fast food for thought. We, we unabashedly lifted that title from the um, Sustainable Food Systems Initiative here in the school um, or in the university. Um, but really, um, the idea of these fast food for thoughts is to give you a sense very quickly of what the topics are that are going to be covered in the breakout rooms. And then we are going to move. And we're going to move to um, rooms on the, up, the next floor up, the third floor. And we're going to spend the next hour and a half or so in dialogue. So I'm going to invite the folks who are doing the Fast Food for Thoughts to come up to the room. While they are moving, please join me in thanking once again um, Monica Lewis. <laughs> Uh, I think we're going to do this fast, so let's stand. It will help us be a little quicker, I think. Um, and who has slides? Um, Simone and I have a slide. Simone and Natalie. All right, I'm going to let you guys. Later. Okay, so. All right, I'm going to start with you guys. And do you have slides? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go every other one, slides, no slides, slides, no slides, so that we can keep things moving okay. along. Any order? So, we'll go first? Yes, why don't you go okay. first? Um, I'll get your slides show started here. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Sampson. I'm coming down the road from University of Michigan Dearborn, and we have three minutes each, Simone and I, to talk, to entice you to come talk to us um, about engaging youth in environmental health research and as activists. As you might notice, neither of us are youth. So my first message would be to speak to youth. Um, but we're going to just talk about a couple programs in two minutes or less that we um, engage youth in in this work. So, oops. Um, so over at University of Michigan Dearborn, we partner with a bunch of community orgs who've been doing Environmental justice work for decades in the Arab American community, um, local groups at the American Muslim Society and Yaba and Access um, and Dearborn Public Schools and the city of Dearborn. And one of the things that we are really proud of is these last two summers we've engaged youth for these two week programs where they do environmental health research to action. So we get them out learning about Air Quality 101, we get them out doing community science with handheld monitors, mapping, um, and then we take them all the way to Policy Advocacy 101 so they learn how to take and make evidence-based um, policy advocacy asks from some of the people in this room who do those trainings. Um, and you see them here with Attorney General Dana Nessel who has um, 
listen to them talk about some of the violations at AK Steel, which was a really powerful presentation they gave after. Um, so, you know, these are a trite list of things, superficial things that we've learned in these last two summers, but I think if we all get together in a space in the breakout room today, we can talk about what does this really mean to institutionalize and lift up youth in these conversations um, and see what they need from us to do this work, what skills and um, how we can follow their lead. So you can read these, but I won't read them to you. And Simone's going to talk about similar work in Flint. Thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Um, I wanted to start off by saying something that adolescents are a key group that we often don't hear from in a lot of these environmental exposure and the crises. And so particularly that was a case in Flint. And so um, it's important to recognize that the youth can serve as equal partners in the research agenda and they can make significant changes in their own community. I think Monica just pointed out that the youth, she said, young people were able to see where we were winning. And that's an important piece to add because a lot of the times the youth also feel disenfranchised but we don't hear from them. And so one of the things that the Flint group is doing um, to obtain the voice of adolescents ages 13 to 17, the director for the Center for Research on Ethnicity, Culture, and Health, Dr. Cleo Caldwell, and the Flint Fathers and Sons Community Steering Committee held focus groups with um, thanks, um, 68 youth in 2016 to get a perspective on how they viewed the Flint water crisis. And then from that, we developed a training pilot training program similar to uh, Natalie's um, around youth participatory action research, uh, where we train the youth on various research skills, both quantitative and qualitative, asset mapping, uh, photo voice, environmental risk assessment, measurements. They went out with their gloves, they did their thing, and they loved the gloves. Um, <laughs> and we wanted to assess the extent to which they would continue or to which they perceive health risks from environmental exposures as um, um, someone this morning, uh, oh gosh, I forgot her name. Um, as she pointed out this morning, um, Oh, Ma Yvonne Lewis, she pointed out that Flint has a lot of issues beyond the lead in the water. And so we taught them more than just the lead, right? Because that's what they wanted to know. And then we wanted to also see that if educating themselves on ways to reduce their risk within their control, which is a key piece, and then if having active involvement in proposing change in their communities will enhance positive development, increase their interest in science careers, and then increase their civic engagement, which all moves towards better mental health. And so in the pilot, we trained 20 youth in this last summer around the topics we talked about. We focused on, um, as we mentioned, their psychological development. We had four days of training, which youth came out for on a Saturday, which I was really impressed by. Two eight-hour trainings. Then they went with community members who had also been trained on the same curriculum. So the community, facilit the community members facilitated their field work, and then they came back, did their data analysis, decided on the story they wanted. Uh, to tell and then so these are some of the lessons and the quotes from those youth um, which I wanted to highlight um, I particularly like the one in the middle so thank you for your time thank you so that uh, that group will be talking in particular about how to mobilize youth and how to prepare youth as the next generation of scientists and activists you don't have slides right no. why don't you go ahead and go while we queue up the next set of slides Hi. As we move to the upstairs, there will be people up there. Just tell them which room you want, which topic you want, and they'll help you find the room. Um, Angie, which one is yours? Testing. Good. Hi, I'm Marcus Cheatham. I'm the health officer at the Mid Michigan District Health Department. A lot of people don't know about the structure of public health in Michigan, so I'm a local health department. I'm not MDHHS. I'm not the state health department. And my jurisdiction includes uh, St. Louis, Michigan, which was the epicenter of the PBB disaster. And that's how I got interested in this topic. Um, we're going to be discussing in my group um, the role of public health in protecting communities. And I would sort of prefer to call that the problematic role of um, public health. Public health is supposed to um, regulate potential polluters. It's supposed to warn the community if something's 
going wrong. It's supposed to do research and uh, you know, work for new legislation to keep people safe. And as we've been hearing today, a lot of times that does not happen. Um, public health doesn't anticipate problems. It doesn't respond. It doesn't promulgate um, new rules. And uh, one of the reasons that that happens is because public health, it's a human organization. People make mistakes, and they're interested in protecting their reputations and wrongly think, like so many people do, if I cover this up, my reputation will be safe, which is reality is the opposite. But more fundamentally, appointed public health leaders report to elected leaders. And as we heard from us this morning, elected leaders need constituencies with money to fund uh, campaigns. And so public health leaders, both local, state, and federal experience being warned, you better not look into that issue, you better not say that in public, or you're gonna be in trouble in your career. So what we're gonna be uh, doing in my group is talking about ways we can ad address that problem, ways to hold people accountable, um, ways that we can uh, tackle problems like the following. Public health represents the racial, social class, and gender biases of our communities because we're from those communities and we tend to replicate the problems that are, that are already there. Um, uh, my talk had, a, had an earlier title, which was Public Health and Registries. Registries are the large databases that government should be creating to track uh, people after exposures so that they can study the impacts on communities. And as we've heard today, that's not happening the way it should be uh, either. So if you're interested in the role of public health, that's my group. If you're interested in data and registries, that's my group. I'm going to be in the Kessler room up on the third floor, halfway down on the left. Thank you. Um, so uh, you've heard a lot of talk today about researchers and community working together in partnership. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what that looks like. Um, and this is based on the, the um, experience of the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center and the Community Action to Promote Healthy Environments, two collaborations that both use community-based participatory research. And it feels very strange to be up here by myself because we always co-present an academic community. I'm the community partner. I'm usually up here with Barbara or Amy, so instead I'm going to channel Barbara and say that this is an approach, it's not a method. That you can use many different methods uh, when you're doing CBPR, um, you can use qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods, right? Did I get that right, Barbara? So, <laughs> so it, it is a partnership that equitably involves both uh, community and academics in all aspects of the research process. You've heard many examples of that up here today. Um, that community partners as well as academic partners are able to contribute their expertise. Both sides have that. And we have shared responsibility and ownership. Um, and there is also, um, by including both of the expertise of both sides, it enhances the understanding of the phenomena that you're trying to study because you have the information from both, um, from both sides. Um, and that integrates knowledge, so it's not just research for the sake of research, there's always an intervention involved or policy um, recommendations or action. Um, some of the key principles of CBPR is it builds on community strengths and resources, so starts from a non-deficit approach, acknowledging that every community has their own inherent set of knowledge and resources and expertise, and then you build on those things. Um, promotes a collaborative and equitable partnership, so that includes decision making, that also includes resources, um, so that community partners are also um, reimbursed for their time, because their time is just as valuable as academics' time. Um, Co-facilitates um, co-learning and capacity building on both sides, so it acknowledges that academics can learn just as much from community and vice versa. Um, and that we're building each other's capacity as we move along, and then balances that research and action so that it's mutually beneficial to both sides, and we've learned how to do that along the way in years, so including making sure our academic partners have time to publish, um, because we know that's important for them to be able to get tenure and stay in their jobs, and we want them to still be there to work with us, but also making sure that there's action that's benefiting the community along the way. Um, this is a continuum that shows the level of power and control along the various uh, 
types of research. So like we the people would be all the way over there to the left, right? Your right should be left, right? <laughs> Um, and investigator-driven research is all the way on this end. Uh, CBPR is um, like next to the left, my left, um, and which is different from community-engaged research. So in community-engaged research, the community may have some level of involvement but does not have the same level of power and control over the decision-making that the research has. has right? Um, and then this is just a quick um, example of some of the accomplishments of translating that research into policy change. This was the, through the Community Action to Promote Healthy Environments where we created a public health action plan and we've been able to use that to um, influence policies both at the city level and the state level around things like um, truck routes and truck idling and um, making sure that there's buffers and being able to have public comment about increased emissions. Um, and in particular, we were able to use the research to get um, 40 plus million dollars in community benefits uh, for the Southwest Detroit community, being able to use the research uh, to inform our policymakers around uh, the Gordy Howe Bridge, the second international bridge. So there, there, there is light at the end of the tunnel or rainbow in the clouds, but there, there are some wins. And particularly when you combine research with uh, community folks, that as other folks have alluded to, that is very, very powerful because you have the data to prove that what you're saying is actually true, but you also have the constituents of those people who wanna get reelected, so their voice is there as well. So it is a very powerful tool. And um, I talk about CBPR being a tool for the resistance. All right, why don't, while we queue up your slides, you, oh, then you go, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Jennifer Haberkamp. I'm the director of the Graham Sustainability Institute here at the University of Michigan. We also house the university's water center. You probably, a lot of you know the director of our water center, Jennifer Reed. Um, I am going to be facilitating the discussion at breakout this afternoon on policy change. For those of us who had the privilege last night of seeing that great film, we also heard inspiring speeches from some of our remarks from some of our Michigan congressional delegation. And uh, Representative Dan Kildee quoted uh, President Abraham Lincoln who said, in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. So with the enthusiasm, the people in on, offline in overflow rooms, I think we have a lot of enthusiasm here. But it's also the case that public sentiment is not by itself enough to ensure good policy outcomes. Decision makers to make do good decisions also need access to good science and they need to understand the perspectives and circumstances of the people that they're regulating. So this breakout session would be a chance to take stock on what are the policies that we need to address the PFAS crisis and how to ensure that the process brings along the key stakeholders and the best available science. So we've heard, uh, even from some of the speakers today, some of the policy recommendations that are out there. I'll just mention a few uh, that we could talk about. Uh, something this complex requires multiple responses at the local, the state, the federal, and even the international level. Um, some that I have heard uh, from groups, and I'm sure there are more, is Michigan should establish strict drinking water standards to protect human health. Michigan and others should regulate PFAS chemicals as a class of compounds, not one at a time in that whack-a-mole way. Um, that the Department of Defense should phase out PFAS in firefighting, foam, and other applications. Um, we've heard some more profound ideas from Linda this morning that we should limit PFAS to just essential uses. There needs to be proof of just the essential use before it would be uh, available to, to be deployed. Um, there are a lot more possible amendments or regulations under the Clean Water Act, the Superfund law. We heard a recommendation to reinstate the tax so that there would be funding to, uh, to actually implement these changes, to extend Superfund to include this category of chemicals. 
Um, even recommendations I've heard that the U.S.-Canada Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement could be brought to bear on this problem. Another one is to flip the presumption. Why is it that we regulate under FDA so that you have to prove that something is safe, whereas with chemicals, you get to use them until somebody comes and gets over the hurdle of proving that they're actually a problem? So those are some of the questions. Other questions we can talk about in this breakout. Okay, how do we prioritize all these policy changes that have been identified? What ideas are missing from these lists? What are the obstacles to their implementation? And uh, in part, what kind of proposals are needed to bring in the data collection that will make sure that the decisions and the policies are based on good science? Um, what are the constituencies and advocates that ought to be brought along? What are the tactics and strategies from other movements like civil rights that we could bring to bear here? So who should come to this breakout session? I think all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The youth are going to do some of that. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of overlap between this and the other groups, but my group too will be in the Kessler room and I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. And Angie just reminded me the, the breakout rooms are in your program. So you can look in your program and see where your breakout room is going to be. So. Hey, um, you guys heard from me already. I'm Courtney Kerrigan at MSU. Um, I'm going to keep this brief. So I'm going to be facilitating a workshop on building national networks, which I feel kind of unqualified to lead. Um, I have some experience with national networks uh, for PFAS, both on the scientific side and on the community side. Um, so I can share those experiences at um, this workshop. Um, but I'm hoping that some people with um, expertise and ideas will come and we can brainstorm you know, what national networks exist, what are gaps, um, where do you see you know, networks are needed, and how can we accomplish those goals. So we'll be in the Henderson room, and I look forward to seeing you. Thanks very much. Reminded me of something I should say, which is we have asked somebody to be sort of a point person in each of these breakout groups, and we have note takers that are available in most of them. A couple of you might need to appoint your own. But really, the idea of the breakout rooms is that everybody in this room has expertise, has experience, has wisdom and insights to bring to the table, so that the facilitators are not really there to lead the conversation more as much as to create a space for a conversation to happen. So please go with that um, idea, with that intentionality, share your ideas. Um, and this re the, I the hope is that we will leave the breakouts having identified a couple of key actions that could be next steps and a couple of key resources that might help make that happen. Um, I do want to say that during the, break, uh, or the, during the break, a couple of you did write additional ideas up on the newsprint out there for breakout groups. One of those was around um, helping the medical, our health care providers be better prepared to address um, environmentally related conditions and diseases that may emerge from that. So there's some interest in a breakout room around that. Um, if you're interested in that, tell the folks upstairs and they'll help you find a space for that conversation. The other conversation, which I'm going to encourage to start with, where'd Courtney go? Um, with Courtney's um, networking is really a conversation that builds on some of the comments that Danelle and others made earlier about we really need to figure out how to work together across the divides, our social divides, our economic divides, and create a movement that transcends that in order to address some of these issues. I think it can start in your room. There may be some, you know, and feel free to break out further if your conversations start. Last thing I'm going to say is that at the end of the day, we're going to reconvene in the Michigan room, which is just across the hall here. We will have food there. We're moving all the posters into that room. So if you didn't get a chance to look at posters, you can do it there. And we will be bringing the results from each of the breakouts into that room so we can have a dialogue across, um, across the groups. Clear what we're doing? So we're a little bit behind schedule. I know. So what do you want us to do for time? Because I'm going to be assigning a timekeeper and ask them to cut us off. Uh, what time is it now? And what time were we supposed to start? Two? Why don't we try to move in five minutes? That We gave us ten minutes to move. So let's move in five minutes and let's end the conversation at Meredith. What time do we have to move? We're supposed to be back in that room at 3.30. 
Think we're okay? Sorry? We're supposed to. We're right on time. So end your conversations in the small group great crowds by 3.30, and then we'll reconvene over here. Okay? Does that work okay? It says 3.55. No? Let me see. The 3.55. We're on time. Oh, 3.55. We're on time. We're on time. Come back to the room over there. Rare, right? I know, right? We're exactly on time. <laughs>